so nothing goes off in the middle of the meeting. Um, can I also just tell you the meeting is being filmed and recorded, so uh, if you do not wish to have yourself on film while you are speaking from the front, then please can you let the camera operators know. Item 1 on the agenda, emergency evacuation procedure. I'll just pass across to our Democratic Services Officer to read out the emergency evacuation procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building by one of the designated exits and proceed to the named assembly point. The designated exits are signposted. From this room, you can use the main door and then the main exit of the building. The assembly point for this building is in Orange Grove on the green outside Browns. Arrangements are in place for the safe evacuation of disabled people. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, uh, we need to elect our vice chair for the remainder of my term the next year. Um, Councillor Davis has kindly agreed to um, carry on with the role. I need a nomination proposal from the floor. If everyone's happy with that, Councillor Simmons. Councillor Crossley, so Councillor Simmons proposed, Councillor Crossley second. Thank you both. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, do we have any apologies for absence of substitutions? I don't think we do. No. Any declarations of interest on the floor, please? Councillor Crossley? Uh And not take. Thank you, Councillor Cross. Anything else? No? Good. Um, no urgent business agreed by the Chair, so I'll pass back again to our Democratic Services Officer to inform you of the public speaking procedure we'll be using today. Thank you, Chair. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaker speaking will be as follows. Firstly, a parish town council representatives will speak and be allowed three minutes in total. Then objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total, followed by the supporters of an application who will be allowed three minutes in total. If there is more than one objector or supporter for an application, they must share the three minutes. Ward councillors who have indicated they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. Speeches will be timed by the traffic light system you can see on the table in front of the chair. At the start, the light will be green and will turn to amber when there is one minute of speaking time remaining. When the light turns red, speakers should immediately conclude their remarks. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we only have one speaker in the room today, loud speaker, I mean, so um, can anybody, everybody who speaks please make sure they're close to their microphone and they speak up clearly. Uh, agenda item seven minutes. Uh, anybody have any comments or can we have those uh, proposed as correct and seconded? Councillor Jackson? On page seven, there's a spelling mistake, I think. Uh, Councillor Bromley has got an E in her name. Um, it's down, sorry, page three, not page seven. Okay. <coughs> so, but anyway, with that correction of uh, how Councillor Bromley's name is spelled, I'll propose their correct record. Thank you. Anybody to second? Councillor Bromley, thank you. Um, item 8, site visit list, we didn't have any from the previous meeting, so we can move straight on to item 9, which is the main plans list, and we start with item 1, which is Homewood Park Hotel. Um, we had a few IT glitches, but if Isabel is ready to present now, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? There we go. 
Yeah, so this application um, is at Homewood Park Hotel in Homewood, Homewood Hinton Charter House. It's for the erection of a rear side and front extension to the existing spa, six uh, new guest suites, a new meeting and event space, admin office and auxiliary uh, accommodation following the demolition of, of various buildings on the site. Before I start the main presentation, there is uh, a verbal update following review of the uh, report and update report by our legal officers. I'll read this to members, I apologise, it's, it's fairly lengthy. The green belt section of the report has incorrectly included building K, store 2, within the volume and area of the buildings to be demolished and replaced under exception D of paragraph 149 of the MPPF. This building was in existence during previous pre-applications, however, since the writing of the report, it has been clarified that this building is not in existence and should not have been included within the officer calculations. Officers note that it is not included within the submissions and this error stemmed from the pre-applications at the site. This has been confirmed by the agent. As such, there is some alteration to the Greenbelt calculations following the update report in terms of the floor area and volume. These are not considered to alter officer conclusion that the development is acceptable in Greenbelt terms. The existing footprint of the buildings is 412 metres squared rather than 422 metres squared as noted in the original committee report and the existing volume is 1295 metres cubed. Looking at the assessment of materially larger under exception D of paragraph 149 of the MPPF without building D as per the update report, the existing footprint is 367 metres squared. The proposed footprint is 382 metres squared and this is an increase of 15 metres squared or 4% over the original footprint. Officers still consider that this is a small increase to the footprint which is not considered to be materially larger. In terms of volume, the existing volume, excluding building D as per the update report, is 1295 metres cubed and the proposed volume of the replacement buildings is 1504. This represents a volume increase which could be considered materially larger. However, officers, as per the report, consider that the assessment of, of, as not appearing materially larger is still the same as the committee report. This takes into account both the spatial and visual aspects. The change in calculations does not change the view of officers that, vi that visually the proposals will not appear materially larger to the, to the site in, as they are infilling existing gaps in the buildings and they're largely located on similar footprints. Moving to the, to the volume of the spa in terms of extensions as assessed under exception C of paragraph 149 of the MPPF, the spa will undergo extensions which equate to a volume increase of 34.5%. This is still considered to be around a third, which is acceptable in regards to Greenbelt policy. Following the review of the report by the Council's legal team, there are two further matters which require clarification. The first is in relation to the openness test. Members should note that if a proposal falls under exceptions listed in, parag in paragraphs 149, so in this case C and D, of the MPPF, then the development is automatically appropriate in Greenbelt terms, and a separate assessment of openness is not required. A separate assessment was given to support the officer's recommendation, which also concluded that the development in question was appropriate, but members should not take that into account here. The second matter is the assessment of the car park. Members are asked to regard the disregard the paragraph within the Greenbelt section titled Additional Car Parking. This paragraph is to be replaced with the following assessment. The proposal sees the addition of further car parking spaces within the site, which will be constructed of grasscrete and located along the existing entrance track. It is considered that these car parking spaces fall within exception B of paragraph 150 of the MPPF, which provides that engineering operations are appropriate development provided they preserve the openness of the greenbelt and do not conflict with the purposes of including land within it. The grass crete itself is not considered to have an impact on openness. However, the inclusion of cars parked in these areas are physical form, which do have the potential to impact upon the openness of the green belt. Whether something does in fact impact upon openness, such that it fails to preserve the openness of the green belt, or conflicts with the purposes of including land within it, is a matter of planning judgment. Officers consider that given the placement of the spaces within the existing boundaries of the hotel and within the context of the site as a whole, they would not in fact have such an impact upon the openness of the green belt or conflict with the purposes of including land within it, and this part of the scheme is therefore appropriate development in the green belt. Finally, in regard to the public sector equality, uh, public sector equality duty, the Council has assessed the impacts of the proposals upon users and neighbours of the site. 
the proposal is uh, appropriate from an equalities perspective. I'll now move on to the main presentation. So here we have a site location plan. Uh, this is the main hotel building here. And then an aerial view which shows the, the hotel and various sort of ancillary buildings to the hotel. The site is within uh, the Greenbelt and the AOMB. So this plan shows the proposed uh, demolitions and proposed footprints of, of the new buildings. So I don't know if you can just see the dotted line, but that, they are the buildings to be demolished. The green are the proposed new buildings and these two elements here and here are the proposed extension to the spa. This is an existing site plan. So members should note that this building has already been demolished as referenced in the committee report. This is the main hotel building, um, and these are the sort of this is the spa and some of the buildings here which will be demolished. The proposed site plan. Sorry, Eleanor, have you got a question? I can't see the cursor. Ah, apologies. That's annoying, but I can't do anything about that, I'm afraid. So I'll stop pointing things out. Um, so this is the proposed site plan. You can see the changes of the guest suites uh, and the extensions of the spa on this site plan. But I'll move on to some floor plans which show this a little bit more clearly. So these are the existing floor plans. You've got the main hotel building, which is just off the uh, south of the, of the page. Um, You've then, you've then got the stable building, the garage, the kennels, which will all be uh, demolished. And then the existing roof plan. And then proposed ground floor plan. So the spa, which is at the top of the page, has undergone the two extensions as shown. And then to the left of the page is the uh, proposed guest suite. So they're actually over two floors. So you can see there the three on the ground floor. Um, to, the, to the right of that is the uh, proposed guest accommodation, um, sorry, the proposed event space um, and other ancillary buildings. The first floor plan is proposed, so you can just see all the, the roof forms of the proposed buildings, but then obviously the uh, second floor of, of the guest suites there with three on the, on the first floor. And finally, the roof plan. Um, so as part of the application, the roof terrace proposed on the spa has been removed from the scheme. Um, there are some sort of roof amenity areas proposed within the guest suites, but they are contained within the uh, roof forms. So these are the these are elevation drawings of the main hotel. Uh, these will remain unchanged, but I've just included them for uh, reference. And these are the existing elevations of the stables at the top, the garage slash store in the middle, and a storage building at the bottom. These are uh, existing elevations of the spa, garden rooms, and kennels. And then we've got some elevation drawings which show the proposed guest accommodation. So they are the uh, gabled buildings in, in a row of three, um, and the proposed sort of event space uh, adjacent to that. Further elevations, just to sort of show you a bit more context within the site. And then the proposed spa elevations. And then just some proposed site elevations which sort of show everything uh, within the context of the existing buildings and, and the proposals on the site. And then finally a landscaping plan um, which shows some additional tree planting and, and hedging to the rear of, of the spa building. Some site photos, so this is walking towards the uh, main, main hotel which will remain unchanged. And then the top photo, the sort of triangular building is the uh, stable block and then you've got the kennels, garage and store on the side. And again, just some of the ancillary buildings which are to be demolished. You can see the edge of the uh, main hotel in the, in the top photo. These are taken from the uh, design and access statement, so these just give a bit of a better context of, of the site. And then this is the rear of the existing uh, spa building. And then some photos looking uh, away from the site, so you can see the properties sort of at the bottom, uh, bottom of the hill, they are, they are residential properties. And again, further views of the rear of the site. 
So this is an extract taken from the design and access statement, but I think it's quite helpful to sort of show uh, the site as a whole, um, you know, from a bit of a distance, so you can sort of see the, the existing spa, kennels, and, and stable building in context with the main hotel, the stone building of the main hotel. And then some further views taken from the design and access statement, uh, which just show the wider, wider landscape and, and how the uh, hotel sort of sits, sits within that context. So the application is recommended permission subject to the conditions listed within the committee and update reports. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three speakers on this one. Uh, if I can have the first speaker up, which is Gary Parker, please. If you'd like to press the mic when you're ready. Good morning. Occur indefinitely. Nor is it right to allow new building under exception D because this only allows buildings to be demolished and replaced if they're to be in the same use. In this case, they will not be. They're now in a non domestic use stables, kennels, a barn, stores, but they will be in domestic use and there's been no application for change of use. This sets a precedent where any collection of sheds or outbuildings could be demolished and turned into a house and they are also being made materially larger. Regarding residential amenity, to correct the report, the nearest neighbors are not 80 meters away from the site, but approximately five. There are not three new guest suites planned, but six. The nearest neighbors share a service road with a hotel that's already frequently blocked, and traffic will greatly increase. According to the NPPG, vehicle movements also affect openness. As the planning officer notes, the hotel has a track record of noise complaints made against it. And contrary to assertions made in the LVIA, they do overlook their neighbors in Pipe House Lane. They have commanding views of us so we can see them. All of this will have a significant and irreversible effect on local amenity. Finally, since 2019, the hotel lowered the boundary hedge around their grounds, revealing the spa in apparent contravention of its 2008 planning permission. In the agricultural field beyond, they've erected a large polytunnel, built a car park, and planted an orchard and garden, and the spa is planned to extend into this area. These infringements of curtilage were reported to planning enforcement last November, but there's been no response. For these reasons, we respectfully ask you to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Kevin Murphy, please, if you could come to the front. Okay. Are we still? No. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. The proposals before you represent over two years of negotiation with two case officers and involving two pre-app submissions, the first made in March 2020 before lockdown. They comp comprise the demolition and replacement of existing buildings on the same footprint, together with modest extensions to the spa alongside landscape and habitat improvements. In response to comments raised by residents, we've met with both parish councils on site last November to understand their concerns. We have since redesigned the scheme to address these issues, supplying additional and revised information. 
A design response is summarised in the addendum to the design and access statement submitted in March. As a former parish council chairman myself, I understand that any change, however well considered, is not always welcome or understood, but believe we have positively addressed all concerns raised. All your officers agree with us. The principle of development and quantum was agreed at pre-app stage prior to submission, and your officers remain of this opinion. The extent of glazing has been reduced by 65% and detailed lighting proposals submitted and agreed. Further ecology assessments and mitigation measures were submitted and your ecology officer is satisfied the proposals are acceptable, subject to conditions we have agreed. Natural England have also confirmed they have no objections. Your landscape officer agrees with the submitted LVIA and considers the revised proposals acceptable. Extensive new planting, including a mixed native species hedgerow, and wildflower orchard, in addition to 60 trees planted by the applicant in 2018, will enhance the setting, provide additional screening, and improve biodiversity. Neither the Council's Highway Officer nor Highways England raise any objections to the proposals, and a draft green travel plan, including provision for EC, sorry, EV bicycle charging, has been agreed in principle. Your Environmental Protection Officer also raises no objection. There will be no loss of privacy or amenity for nearby residents located over 80 metres away. The spa roof terrace and first floor balconies have been removed and the rising intervening land and new planting will mostly obscure ground floor accommodation. The new buildings will also be sustainable, a 26% reduction in regulated CO2 emissions using air source heat pumps and photovoltaics. In summary, we have worked with your officers for over two years and the principle of development has been agreed. We have listened to feedback from residents, engaged with the parish councils and made significant changes to the design. They are fully supported by your officers and are policy compliant. They represent the final phase of development required to secure the long-term post-COVID viability of this established hotel, an important local employer and contributor to Bath's tourism offer. To conclude, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to speak and urge you to support your officers' professional recommendation and approve this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, can we have Councillor McCabe? Is this one? Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, as you will have gathered, this is a prominent site. Um, now, my understanding is that the hotel gets the permission to build the spa back in the day, but the condition was a green hedge uh, to both hide the development uh, and to keep it within the site boundary, thereby protecting the prominent position uh, and protecting the green belt and the area of outstanding natural beauty. And as far as I'm aware, then the hotel buys the property next door, which is a house with equestrian buildings. The house very quickly becomes part of the hotel, and now they're looking to um, rationalise the existing volumes on site by demolishing the structures uh, and building new accommodation units. So this should just be a straightforward assessment against planning policies, right? And certainly from the original submission, much improvement has been made from the big glass frontages that look straight down into the houses on Pipe House, Pipe House Lane. We now have units that have been orientated uh, 90 degrees to the southeast, uh, leaving only slim windows. But these windows are in the living accommodation area and people will look out at them because of the view. Uh, so a reduction in overlooking, potentially, but the, the heights of the new units are considerably more than is currently on site, uh, with the first floor balcony for guests to enjoy the view as well. And the site is prominent. Now I have stood in Mr. Parker's bedroom and I've looked up at the site, and in my view, he will have no option but to purchase um, uh, uh, net curtains in order to maintain the privacy in his bedroom. Uh, and I'm assuming it's the same for the other buildings. Uh, because anyone looking out of the new windows will look, or from the balconies, will look straight down into their houses. Um, so I would like committee to carefully consider the impact this element of the application will have on the neighbours, uh, as well as the mentioned illumination impact right across the valley from this prominent site. I don't really have any issues about the reuse of the other structures on site and the other buildings and the other purposes. So let's talk on, about the spa. Uh, firstly, you shouldn't be able to see the spa from anywhere in the valley, but you can as you saw from the photos earlier. Its bright yellow wall was supposed to be hidden by green infrastructure as a condition of permission 
to build the spa in the first place. The Scraggy Hedge is not in a good state, and as you've heard, it's been lowered, uh, but it still marks the boundary of the residential or developed area and the green fields. This application seeks to extend this structure beyond the current boundary to demolish the green infrastructure and extend the building into the field. So I'd like you to ask some tough questions of the officer about this, because I can't think of another example where this would be allowed. I have residents who are struggling to get permission to get a bit of garden from a green field in the green belt. In the green belt, not even in the AONB. But to extend a building out uh, seems very uh, unusual. Uh, you may deem this to be acceptable because the two semicircular hedges will be planted, hiding the spar extension and housing an orchard that guests can stroll through. I'll just remind you that this is a commercial operation and the view is a selling point and there is nothing to be gained from hindering the guests' enjoyment of the view. So tough questions, please, about extending into the field. Now, overall, you've heard there's questions about volume that have been raised by others, and there is distinct concern from the parish councils uh, that in 1948 there was considerably less volume on site, considerably less, uh, and that the site has expanded over those years in a piecemeal fashion, and officers seem to have a tendency to then lump it all together and start again uh, in terms of volumes. So careful questions about the volumes. Um, there's the question, therefore, what I've raised about extending a new building in the green belt, uh, extending the spa building out from the residential area and into the field, and destroying the green infrastructure was the, that was a condition of previous permission to build the spa in the first place. There's questions about the height and the overlooking of the new residential units and the resultant loss of amenity. And whilst we might want to support commercial operations such as Homewood Park uh, in the Green Belt and AONB, surely we should be encouraging development within the site boundary first before we give up more green fields. Uh, and with a prominent site such as this, shouldn't we be putting harm front and center? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCabe. Um, that's the end of the speakers. So, uh, questions to the officers, please. Councillor Hodge. Sorry, Chair. I just want to put a question to the Chair, actually, in advance of the questions to the officers, but it does make a difference. Um, I just wonder whether the information we've been given at the start of the meeting, quite detailed information, has been circulated in any way in advance. Was, I can't find it on my emails um, at all. Uh, yes, I believe it has. Can someone confirm This that? morning's information. Yeah, the, we had an update report and then yeah. the... Yeah, the staff this morning is a verbal update following um, discussions with, with the legal officer. I don't know if they, they want to clarify further on this matter. So the extensive, I just want to be clear, it's a verbal update just now, isn't it? So we haven't had it in advance of this committee. So I, I, I have a problem with this because it's a lot of detail on volume that... Volume is the crux of the, one of the key important things here, and we haven't seen it in advance of the committee. We haven't had a chance to look through it in detail, um, and that will affect the questioning we have, because my questioning is around the reports and the update report we've been given. So I think we need to bear that in consideration. Um, it's going to make questioning quite difficult on volume. So we have a whole heap of information that we haven't seen in advance. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if we can have a ruling on this circumstance from anybody. I mean, ultim ultimately, Chair, it's it's a matter for the committee as to whether the whether the application uh, needs to be deferred to a to a future meeting. Um, um, there was a written update circulated a couple of days ago. Um, there has been quite a lot of information verbally given uh, this morning by the case officer, which, is, which has just come to light. Um, there's, there's, there's not really a great more that we can say on that matter. I mean, obviously, the, the, the case officer can feel questions on, on, on what she said and, and on the content of the report. But ultimately, um, if members feel that they need time to properly digest what's been said, um, it is obviously within the committee's gift to, to defer the application for one cycle. Um, and it, it may be that the committee wished to defer the application anyway for a site visit. Um, so that's something that could be uh, considered. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Davis. I think in light of that, and I suspect I, I thought because it might be um, a good option here, I would wonder if we actually do defer it, but with a site visit beforehand, and that information that was given to us verbally is circulated, and then if we've got questions before our site visit, we could possibly pass them so that we're ready um, at the site visit, which um, I'm afraid would be when I'm on holiday, having said all that, but it's just, an, uh, I'm quite happy to propose that. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, what we'll do, we'll carry on with our questions to officers, to the officer, complete that, and then when we come to the debate, uh, if somebody would like to propose that we defer and have a site visit, then I'm quite happy to take a vote on that, and it will give us time to digest the new information in the verbal update. Councillor Jackson. I am not sure in these COVID times that I should be sharing a microphone with Councillor Hughes. And I notice that all around the table, we don't in fact have enough microphones. And this is obviously a matter of some concern, even if you are fully jabbed up. Anyway, um, it seems to me we've got a number of ambiguities here and problems. And uh, as I understand the case officer, she is saying that these, this new information, uh, which I had not heard or seen before now, um, doesn't change her view. But I think that probably a number of us would want to sit down and crunch these figures um, because we might come to a different interpretation of the facts. I've also got an issue with the arboricultural um, state of reportage in the report in that there seems to be some ambiguity as to what the arboricultural officer recommended. And I... Should, I would have asked yesterday if I'd been able to get online um, whether there was any update on the tree matter and I, th I think I th I'm going to propose we do have a site visit but I think it would be quite helpful if we could scope uh, for the officer where we've got problem areas the one obviously of course being the calculation on the volumes I've got a, I think there's a fundamental contradiction in the arboricultural information and of course we're also handy, I found it very, I know I've got sight problems, but I think we all had problems trying to see what the officer was indicating without a cursor. So for these reasons, I'm proposing that we defer to the next meeting. I'm sorry about this from the point of view of the applicant and all the people who've come here today, so that we can try and just get the facts a bit straighter before we, it's obviously a very important decision. There's a lot of millions of pounds involved. And we need to, I think, um, be uh, above challenge, you know, that we are making a decision on facts and on policies. And um, unfortunately, it's going to need a bit more time to sort this out. Hello. Sorry. Uh, yes, I'm, I hear what you're saying, Councillor Jackson. I think we've, we've already agreed that once we've done questions, we are allowing for that to be proposed. We're moving to the debate on the matter of some microphones. Can I just ask IT whether that would be possible to put any more microphones out for anyone that feels that they would like one? Okay, so we'll look at it for next week, but uh, Councillor Jackson, uh, I noticed you had an extra mic at the front, so would it be possible for that to let Councillor Jackson have one? Okay, okay. I, I think when there were two mics at the front, they did both work. Okay. I had make a note, made a note that I would uh, ask Karina to sort it out for next time, Councillor Jackson. Um, are you able to bear with it this time, or would you like to...? Okay. Right. Yeah, no, I had already made, asked for that to be changed for next time, because that doesn't really work, yeah. Um, right, where were we? Questions? <laughs> Councillor McPhee. Um, I was going to do Mr. McCabe's uh, uh, work for him um, and ask a question. One of his questions was, 
that uh, the buildings were extending into another field and that this was uh, surprising perhaps to him and that uh, uh, you should have been trying to develop within uh, the range. Uh, how do you respond to that? So I'll just, I'm just going to go back to a plan which is and the aerial view. So actually have a cursor now, it seems to be appeared. So this, this here is the spa building as existing and this is the area of hedging uh, that, that Councillor McCabe was, was referring to. Uh, this imagery is from 2019. Um, so the extension to the rear sort of comes out from, from here. Um, yes, this is, this is a field owned by the hotel. I mean, this area here is not, is not green grassed as a field. I, I therefore don't have an issue with, with the spa extending out to the rear here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's obviously for the committee to decide whether or not they do take issue with that, but my view is that on the ground that it can be viewed as, as within the hotel site. It is land which is owned by the hotel, um, so it's not, it's not a concern that, that, that officers have raised, but again, if members want to take an alternative view, that's, that's fine. Sorry, there was one other one that Councillor McCabe made, was I think about the date because it was 1948, but perhaps we're using, which data are we using now? Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. You're referring uh, to the green belt? Y yeah, the, the volume setting, was it? The, yeah, the volume setting, which year of the building is the base year? So the base year, yeah, for, for Greenbelt is 1948. I mean, obviously, the MPPF specifies, um, and, you know, if this is a relation to extensions, for example, it, it specifies that extensions uh, to, to a building as, as an individual entity. So if that building was built after 1948, that would be, that would be the building. Um, so officers, you know, the, the report in, in that respect is, is kind of clear. That's very strange. Um, the report uh, does obviously run through the green belt. I, I accept there has been new information which has come to light very recently, which has had to be circulated verbally, and I apologise for that. Um, but I think better to do it verbally than not at all. Um, so yeah, the 1948 is the baseline. But obviously, if, if those buildings are built later, it's as they are originally built, um, and that's what officers have taken in in, in this respect. Okay, Councillor Hutt. Yes, sir. Hello. Oh, that's better. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is a volume question. It's a bit complicated, but I feel I need to ask it because it, you know, we've made really strict decisions on volume with very small properties, and we need to get to the bottom of the volume issue. And with the update report, a, a resident um, pointed out one particular error that had to be addressed. And I, I want to get to the bottom of this issue of exception C and exception D, and the exception C sort of section of the report goes through um, the issue of, of the third increase um, with the 33%, um, 48% volume increase um, to the spa, and, and then looks at it in a different way, um, as if we're looking at the replacement of the built form using the kennels as a replacement of the built form. But it, it seemed in that paragraph, it seems to mix two concepts to me, because we, we look at the volume and say there's a volume increase of an extension of 31%, which would be acceptable because it's less than a third. But actually, when we're looking at replacement of built forms, we're looking at same use and materially larger. And we do have something that is materially larger in the 31%. So in that second paragraph, I've and we do have a change of use. So we're making an argument that by looking at the kennel area attached to the spa, that it is OK because it's a replacement built form. But all the parameters still show that it will be materially larger to the extent of 31%, and it's not the same use. And um, I, I would, um, the other question I have is about saying, storage areas 
renaming um, them as ancillary to the hotel so that they don't represent a change of use when they become spa areas. So spa areas have you know, lots of different um, considerations. They're used by people, they use energy, they have climate emergency considerations. So I don't, I think storage becoming a element of a spa, I, by categorizing it as hotel ancillary, it's moving away from the, um, the reality of the change of use. So it, it's two questions really. That volume, second, lot, second paragraph of the um, C volume calculation and also the assumption about change of use being okay. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hodge. So I'll I'll look at the uh, use, uses first. That's probably the easiest thing to start with. Um, all of the buildings that are on this site are considered to be within hotel use or, or ancillary buildings to the hotel and therefore are encompassed within that use. They are called things like kennels, stable, etc. But they are not, you know, they're, they're not used for the keeping of dogs or horses or anything like that. They are used by the hotel for purposes associated with the hotel. So officers are satisfied that they can be considered within the same use, that there isn't a change of use um, occurring. And I don't know if Chris or the legal officer might have a view on that in a moment, but you know, it, that they're being used together as as the use of as the use of a hotel. Um, so in that respect, officers are satisfied that there isn't a, a, a change of use taking place. In regards to the volume, etc., yes, that, that part of the assessment, uh, the assessment is, is quite complex. I mean, essentially, um, you know, development in the green belt need, to be appropriate needs to fit one of the exceptions. Um, you can use, as I have in the report, a combination of the exceptions. Sometimes that is entirely appropriate to do so because there are different things going on. Um, in this case, you can see here, yep, you can see my cursor. So this building here, Building D, which I believe from memory is, is, is the kennels, is being demolished. Now, in the uh, assessment that the, the, the agent's given us, you've got all these extensions to the spa, including the fitness suite, etc. They do amount to extensions which are over a third. But obviously, we do have to take into account that this building here is, is being demolished. And actually, the fitness suite and kind of and, and you know even an element really of, of the treatment room is is replacing that. So my view is that it's perfectly valid to consider that element an, a, of a spa extension under under the assessment of materially larger. Um, I mean, if the committee want to take a different view, I think as long as you could justify that, that would be acceptable. Um, but I, I do think it fits it fits within that exception, and therefore I think that's why it's appropriate to to, to assess it as such. I think the report sort of runs through um, it being considered an, an extension, which perhaps has maybe muddied the waters a little bit, because because that is what the submission essentially does. Um, and I think it was sort of appropriate to, to address that and, and sort of note why officers weren't doing it that way. Um, so that's that's the conclusion that officers have come to. Obviously, we have concluded that it's appropriate development in the green belt, but you know, obviously, again, if 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 the committee want to come to a different conclusion, that that would be fine. Um, in regard, again, to sort of materially larger, I know you've spoken about the volume and that being above a third. I think it's quite important when, to, just to note that when you consider materially larger, we don't have, there's not the same policies as it were about um, there being an increase of a third. The, the assessment of materially larger isn't, isn't solely based on volume. It's not even solely based on footprint. It's also, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an assessment of visually and spatially together, how how that built form will appear within the context of the site. Um, you know, obviously, yes, the volumes are completely relevant, but I don't. You, you know, you you shouldn't be basing the assessment of materially larger solely as a volumetric exercise. So they are important. They are they are a consideration, um, and they do form part of that assessment. But I think you know, officers have said that if you considered the volume on its own. You probably, you know, you you would consider this, consider it materially larger. But I think officers, you know, when visiting the site and looking at it together, visually, it it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have that that materially larger visual visual impact. But again, that is a matter of planning judgment and totally valid to to make a different assessment on that. Okay. Thank you. I'll second to my uh, one that to pass it to Shelley. Yes, uh, Councillor Bromley. Okay. Oh, thank next. you. Can you can you hear that? Sorry, there you go. Lovely. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question um, rega is regarding the the lux definitions, um, the figures around the the lux, um, the overspill of, of light. And uh, I mean, considering that Homewood Park is in an elevated position, 
Um, so the report on, on page 55 uh, states that the reduction in glazing on the rear of the guest accommodation now minimizes light spill um, onto this newly created habitat to the northeast to 0 0.5 lux at three meters, result in no light spill uh, onto the uh, tree line located to the northwest. Um, my question really is that considering that Homewood Park is on, in an elevated position regarding the, the surrounding houses and, and, and other dwellings, um, cle clearly even though there's been a reduction, um, and these are within legal definitions, I, I assume, uh, presumably though that there will still be a more, the, the new spa will be more visible still because even with the reduction, there, there will be, they will be very visible, really, the new, the new guest accommodation and, and the spa, considering its elevated position. That's fine. I'm just... There we go. So, again, this is taken from the design and access statement, but it's just quite helpful. So, the properties at the... I'll call it the bottom of the hill... Um, are about 70 to 90 metres away, depending on which property and which building you're, you're measuring from. So they are some distance from, from the hotel. And I don't think officers are, you know, even suggesting that, that the hotel is not visible. It absolutely is from those properties. Um, from an ecological perspective, the ecologist is, is satisfied with, with the re revisions to the re reduction, the glazing, um, from, a, from a light spill perspective. But yes... Obviously, there is going to be an introduce, introduction of, of additional built form and additional glazing, which, which is going to result in, in more, more light spill from, from the site. However, you know, the, the applicant has, has uh, changed the scheme to, to minimise that as, so, as far as possible. Um, there will be vegetation screening. There is vegetation screening proposed, which will screen the existing spa to some extent. Um, I think it's worth noting, I think the spa closes at 8pm, uh, um, from memory, and you know there possibly could be conditions added which could control um, lighting ti timings for for that building. I mean, obviously, you know, in terms of the guest suites, it'd be a bit more difficult to do that because I think it's quite unreasonable for you know hotel users to have to turn the lights off after a certain time. It, it wouldn't be safe, etc. Um, but I think that you know you, that. There is already a, spa, a, a, a hotel at the site. There is already light spill from the site. Um, you know, it, it is the view of officers that that light spill and the distance from the dwellings, especially the ones at the bottom of the hill, is sufficient enough so that that glare isn't so significant that it's, it's going to have a significant detrimental impact to their residential community. Um, but, you know, again, officers are not, are not disputing the fact that the hotel is visible and can be seen and that lighting will, will, co will cause some impact or has the potential to cause some impact. Um, but, you know, there, there have been changes made so that officers now feel that it's, it's an acceptable level. But again, that, that is a matter of planning judgment. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, the fact that there is that these, these, this guest accommodation, presumably, uh, as um, Councillor McKay stated, um, it's sold on, on, the, on the, the, because, because there's a view. And so, therefore, the, the light spill from the guest accommodation will continue right through late into the evening, into the night, won't it? So that's difficult to put a condition on. I mean, I know, I know you can with the spa, but obviously not with the, the new guest accommodation. Yeah, I mean, I would just also draw attention to, so this, these are the uh, ele site elevation drawings, and these are actually the, the elevations which, which now face that, that face really the, the directions of many of the properties, um, you know, although there is some, there is some movement in, in that, depending on the angle of the properties, etc. But these are the, these are the windows now proposed on, on the first floor. They are narrow, they have been minimised, there is obviously, you know, of course, glazing on uh, the ground floor as well to be considered and there are small sort of terraces within uh within the roof within the roof forms roof spaces so you know yes that there, there will be there will be additional light spill and you know that officers aren't are not again denying that at all but i think that you know from from my perspective it's been minimized so that it would it wouldn't be uh wouldn't cause a significant adverse impact in in that respect okay that's the jackson well, I think that's very helpful. Um, but on page 55, with the reference to the 8 p.m. curfew, uh, I don't quite get this because it's daylight until half past 10 at the moment, so not using the day lounge when it's daylight seems odd. But conversely, of course, in winter, it's dark by 5 o'clock. 
Uh, and I do think also they haven't, the species of, the habits of bats are not fully represented in this report. There's no mention of the Beckstein bat, which hangs out literally in trees. And if this is an area, they're a quite rare form of bat, though they are actually in my neighborhood. Um, but seriously, you know, we, we need to know a bit more detail. But I think at root, is, there's a contradiction, which perhaps the officer could address next time, um, between the desire to have uh, proper screening around, proper environmental protection, planting the trees, which is great, um, and the guests wanting a view across the valley. It's obviously a very scenic spot, and I don't know how you reconcile that. I really don't. So perhaps that could be meditated upon for the next presentation. So was there a question in all of that? The question is, can we consider these uh, apparently irreconcilable aspects of the application? Because there may very well be a perfectly sound answer out there. However, we actually haven't addressed Councillor McCabe's question about the loss of amenity to the neighbour who will need to get some kind of screening or blinds. So perhaps that could also be in the next report. So, so are you wanting the officers to answer anything now as we're in questions? I'm just making a few suggestions with a question mark because <laughs> what I, the way I'm looking at it may not be appropriate. The officer obviously has the expertise. I mean, I'm happy to give a view on some of those Thank answers you, if that's well. helpful. Um, so, in regard to the bats, the council's ecologist has, uh, well, the applicant has, has submitted the necessary protected species and, and ecology surveys, which have been submitted, um, have been assessed by our ecologist. Um, revised information was submitted to to address the, the first round of comments given, uh, and that was then that was then reassessed. The council ecologist has has addressed the issue of bats. Um, that has been addressed in the report and that there is no objection from the ecologist subject to conditions. Naturally, uh, we, we had to do um, habitats uh, risk assessment and Natural England have had sight of that. They, again, also have no objection subject to conditions. So I don't, I don't think going forward the officers will be able to provide any more clarification on those matters to the committee because they you know, they, they have been assessed in accordance with the appropriate policies and, and le relevant legislation. Um, again, the issue of amenity is, is obviously a, a matter of planning judgment. And, you know, I've, I've sort of explained to, to, uh, in, in response to Councillor Bromley's question that my assessment is the light spill isn't going to be so significant that it would, you know, impact, impact the neighbours to a point which would warrant a refusal. But that, that, is, that is absolutely a matter for the committee to discuss and, and make the decision on. I can only recommend you know, my, my, my professional judgment on that. Um, in regard to the planting, etc., obviously there is, there is planting um, proposed. You can see here hedging additional trees uh, noted about the point in terms, of, in terms of the view. However, officers are sort of looking to, to secure landscaping, etc., by condition. Um, and you know it would it would be conditioned, and, and this is quite standard that any sort of trees or, or vegetation which is which die or has to be removed within a period of five years is is then replaced. Um, you know, obviously these trees could could be pruned, etc. I think it'd be quite unreasonable to say that you know they would never be able to pr prune the trees, but they are proposing additional planting, and yes, that may be in the sight line of, of the proposed guest accommodation, but I don't think that that's a material planning consideration that we could reasonably refuse the development on the basis that there might be some visual conflict between between those trees and and you know the I guess the the taking advantage of, of the views by by site users. So I think you know obviously the landscaping is is viewed positively um, in in line with with council policy. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm happy to sort of further clarify in a report if necessary, um, but I do think that those those issues have have been addressed. Okay, Councillor Jackson. Can I suggest somebody seconds my proposal for a site visit? Well, when we get to the debate, yes, at the moment we're still on questions. To the officer, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, well, I'm happy to share a microphone, by the way. <laughs> Um, okay, so first of all, um, on this issue of change of use, sorry if you've 
if you, if you feel that the explanation is, it was already um, sufficient. But, I mean, recently we went to a, a disused stables in the Greenbelt to, on, a, on a site visit to look at a change of use to residential. I can't understand how that differs from this application in terms of requiring a change of use from stables. I believe it, you might be referring to the uh, site at Church Farm in Priston. I, I think I was on that site visit. Um, yeah, so the stables here, they, they are not used for equestrian use. They are, I've, I've been to the site, they're used for, you know, essentially storage for, for the hotel. There were some tables in them, might have been some chairs, I, I, can't, I can't remember precisely. Um, so these buildings are ancillary buildings to the hotel. Um, you know, they are considered as such as, uh, to officers. I, I think that if members wanted to come to a different conclusion on that, that they, the evidence would need to be presented to suggest that that was an equestrian stable building. Um, I think it would be quite difficult given that there isn't a single horse on the site at the moment, and I, I don't believe there has been for, for a number of years, although I'd have to get that clarified from, from the applicant, and I can do so. Um, the same, you know, the same with the kennels. Again, they're not, you know, there's no dogs kept on the site, etc. So they are ancillary buildings that are on the hotel site, are used within within the complex of the hotel, um, and I, I wouldn't, you know, my, my professional view is that I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, having them as, you know, defining them as a different use class. But that was the exact the exact same discussion we had over the the, the site visit was the fact that it was a disused stable and there weren't actually any horses on site. Um, I really don't understand how that differs, but okay. So, uh, second question then. Um, I'm always a bit concerned when I hear the, the words noise complaints. So their plan is to operate seven days a week and the hours have been restricted to seven to 11. Is that right? So officers haven't recommended uh, any conditions restricting the hours of, of use at the site. Um, I think you know that it, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be impossible to, to put a condition on perhaps securing the hours of use of of the spa or the event space, etc. But I, after the uh, committee briefing yesterday, I did go away and look at the license for the uh, premises, um, and the hotel is licensed to sell alcohol and for performances of recorded music indoors, so, you know, any sort of music DJ set uh, of, of recorded music between 10 a.m. and 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, late night refreshments can also be served between 11 p.m. and, and 1 a.m. So I, I do understand concerns relating to noise, and obviously there will be the creation of, of a new uh, event space. I think that it's important to view the context of that, uh, that to view that in the context of, of the hotel as a whole, which is currently operational, can currently hold events and have indoor music and the sale of alcohol until one o'clock in the morning under their license. I think that it would, you know, my view is that adding such a condition restricting that outside of those hours probably wouldn't be necessary or, or reasonable because it would conflict with, with, with the license, which, you know, has previously been deemed an acceptable noise level. Our environmental protection team were, were also consulted on the proposal and, and had no comment to make. They didn't have you know, an, an objection to the scheme. Um, so officers are, are of the view that it is acceptable, but again, if, if, if members are concerned about that, that is something which could, could be discussed. Well, with respect, the officers don't live next door to the site. Um, so there's not going to be any restrictions on use. Is there going to be any restrictions on use of outdoor space for events? time limits on outdoor space use? Most, venue, most, most venues have a, have a restriction, even in the centre of Bath, of, I think of up 10 o'clock, to be able to use outdoor space for events. So I think, I think it's important to, to note, obviously, that the hotel is, exist, is existing and, it, and, is, and is used that way. Um, there are, it, we wouldn't be able to impose conditions on other parts of the hotel, or it wouldn't be reasonable to impose conditions on other parts of the hotel, being, in my view, being used, you, you know, for outdoor events that, that is, there aren't current restrictions that, that those areas are subject to. This application is, is for this, this event space here. As far as I'm aware, there isn't an outdoor area proposed. It's, it's an indoor private dining small event space. 
Um, as I say, if, if members wanted to take the view that, that there were, that, you know, there were noise issues and wanted to restrict the hours of use of that, that is something which could be considered. Officers don't consider it necessary, but that that's, is a matter of planning judgment for the committee to decide. Okay. So, sorry. Just um, as, as a, well as a minimum, and I would expect the applicant to be supplying um, an acoustic report. I would expect them to be supplying something to demonstrate that they're not going to be increasing the ambient noise levels for the adjoining properties. So is that something that can be requested? Um, I probably have to refer to Chris Gond to this, but it hasn't been requested by our environmental protection team. I don't know, Chris, if you've got a view on that. If the committee is minded to defer the application, um, it, of course, there's, there's nothing stopping us requesting it. I don't think we'd, we, we, we wouldn't be able to insist upon it because that's not something that the environmental protection team have asked for. But we, we, as I say, if the, if the application is deferred, we, we could certainly ask and, and report back at the next meeting. Okay, Councillor Hodge, you have another question? One more question. That's fine, that's working now. It's, could we go back to the picture which showed the spa with the reduced size of hedging around it? So it was the, the view of the hotel, the, the property at the foreground, and the, yes, no, sorry, that, no, further on, sorry, the, the hotel, that's it, that one there. So I just wanted to be clear, so we've talked quite a lot about conditions, that this could be subject to conditions on lighting and a tree planting plan. And I, I would like to be clear what um, hasn't, what in terms of condition three in the previous application, what wasn't delivered with that? So I think that is a material consideration. If it wasn't delivered before and has been removed, what confidence have we got that any of these conditions will be adhered to again? So could you let, let us know really what has been changed with the screening that should have been there and what trees have been removed that were conditioned in the previous application? So I don't, I don't have the decision before me, I don't have the wording of the condition, so I would have to go away and get that, which I can do, you know, if we are going to defer this for the next meeting. But this hedge, as, as far as I'm aware, was, was conditioned as part of the previous application. Um, but I don't, I don't think there was a condition on there which would have prevented that being pruned or removed. Again, I would have to check that. Um, I know planning enforcement are, are looking at these matters. Um, they are still coming to a conclusion on that, and I, you know, I have, I have had conversations with, with the enforcement officer. However, we do have to assess the application that, that is before us. Um, obviously, you know, stricter conditions could be put on this time, and, uh, as I've said about you know, if, if, a, if a hedge dies or, or becomes disease, etc., that it would be replaced, and, and to, or, or that the hedge can remain in perpetuity or, or something of, of, of of that nature. Um, as far as I'm aware, there was no condition which stated that this hedge had to remain in perpetuity. I, I think the condition related to it being provided, but I would have to go away and check the wording of that condition on that application to, to uh, be certain. So the, the wording was the existing trees and planting to be retained within the site. That was condition three. So. Um, I think in the report, the ward councillor has, has, has flagged up that the trees were removed. I, I think we have to know which trees were removed to have any confidence in another a landscaping scheme coming forward. Understood. And again, that is a matter which I will leave with planning enforcement, who are obviously investigating that because it has been reported to them. I, again, I, I do reiterate that it wouldn't necessarily prevent this application moving forward. Um, you know, as I say, stricter conditions could be put on to make sure they are, they are, you know, the timing of them being provided, etc. So I, I don't think it would be, uh, it, I don't think we'd be able to refuse this application on the basis of, you know, live enforcement complaints, etc. at the site. This, this application doesn't, you know, necessarily regularise the, the loss of those trees and if enforcement do consider that, that they need to be replaced or, or that matter needs to be taken forward, they will obviously do so appropriately, but I, I can't fully comment on, you know, the, the status of, of that investigation at the moment. Any more questions, please? No? Can we move to the debate then? I think we probably have a proposal. Mm. Councillor Jackson.
for a site visit, which I hereby propose. So um, I believe what we talked about before was a deferment so that the information that was provided as a verbal update today can be added to the proper report, um, plus a site visit. Well, Chair, I mean, at the end of the day, I want to stand in that field and look at the actual spatial relationships of one thing to another. And I'm sure the officer will give us all the information she possibly can, but there's no substitute for actually standing there. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, I've got no problem with the site visit, Councillor Davis. Um, if, I agree. If we use the word deferment, it would give them up to, say, two months to find some of that information if there's any reason why they can't get, because we've actually asked for quite a lot of information. So there's nothing to stop us having a site visit as would be the normal time. Um, but I'm not sure whether legally, whether we can say deferred up to two months, which means it could come back next time. But if there's some information still missing, and we have asked for quite a lot, um, that would just give them a little bit longer. Perhaps we could get some advice from here. If that's the case, I'm quite happy to sort of second uh, what Councillor Jackson said. Uh, so I think what is being asked is, can we say deferment until the matters that have been discussed here have been clarified? And we have had a site visit, but the site visit can go ahead um, sort of in the next slot. Is, is that okay, Chris? Thank you, Chair. Um, committee certainly can defer the application for more than one month. Um, all I would say really is that it, it really shouldn't be open-ended. And I think, it, I, I think it should ought to be in the uh, resolution that um, it's up to two months uh, uh, as a maximum. Thank you. Are you okay with that, Councillor Jackson? So the motion is to defer the um, application for up to two months so that the officer can gather the information that we've talked about today um, and pass it to the committee members for consideration. And in that two months, we'll have a, also have a site visit, which we could have in the next site visit slot. We don't have to wait till the one after. Then if all the information is available, it can come before the next committee. Sorry, that was a long statement, but are you happy with that, Councillor Jackson? Are you happy to second that, Councillor Davis? Is it a problem? Will the um, application run out of time when they can go straight to appeal for non-determination within the prescribed time? Need some help from my left on that one? Or the officer? Uh, the, cu the current target date is, is, I think, next week. So, uh, yes, the, the application would run out of time if it's, if, it's, if it's deferred. That's correct. So, that is a risk. But I think I'm hearing from the committee that they're not comfortable for it to go ahead now. So, I'm sure the officer will um, get as much provided of what we'll ask for by... The next meeting. Um, so, okay. So, motion we have on the table is to defer to get the extra information and um, have a site visit proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Davis. Um, is the officer and, and Chris, are you happy that you understand everything that needs to be provided? Okay. So, all those in favour? Against? Yeah, ab abstentions. Eight in favour, one against. Eight in favour, one against, and one abstention. Thank you, so that is carried. Thanks, everyone. Um, right, we need to switch over offices. We've been going for an hour. If anyone would like a comfort break, please take one and come straight back.
Um, Lansdowne View, uh, Twerton, uh, Councillor Crossley has left the committee, uh, as stated at the beginning for this one. Um, and I think we've done our switch over. It's been a bit complicated today because we're having problems. Um, but yeah, if the case officer is ready, could ask him to do the presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is item two on the agenda, which is um, a development site uh, to the rear of Lansdowne View, um, South Down, and it's a proposal for the erection of seven new dwellings with access improvements and associated external works. Uh, before I get into the um, presentation proper, there's a couple of very small updates, um, in, in verbal updates to the report. On page 79, under the Community Infrastructure Levy, there's a reference to this being spent on the, the Council's SIL 123 list. That should actually read Infrastructure Funding Statement. Uh, so just a, a minor clarification there. And then on page 80, it refers to the very early stage of the um, local plan partial update. Um, the, those words, very early stage, should just, uh, very early should be removed because we're actually slightly further along than a very early stage now, but um, the weight is still uh, limited as per that paragraph. Um, so with that out of the way, I'll launch into the presentation. Um, so hopefully you can see the cursor now. Um, so the application site is this site here in red. And as you can see, it's land to the rear of Lansdowne View there. We've got the uh, Bristol to Bath uh, railway line that runs just immediately north of the site. We've got Lansdowne View, which runs down here, and, uh, and also around this corner. These properties are also part of Lansdowne View, but then this does change into Kings George Road uh, as we go further this way. Um, and you can see, yeah, just make a note of where the eastern boundary uh, ends here. So it's just in line with the, where the terrace ends and where the two semi-detached properties start. Um, because on the next page, uh, there is uh, some history on this site. Um, some, a, few, a couple of members on the committee may remember this. It was a long time ago, but um, there was a proposal uh, back in 2013. Uh, I think it was Curo Homes promoting it. Uh, for 21 uh, dwellings on this uh, parcel of land, although it was a slightly enlarged parcel of land. So if you look down here at the terrace, so um, it did include this land to the east here as well, and an access coming off King George's Road. Um, so that was um, refused by the committee uh, on the grounds of character and appearance, uh, impact on residential amenity and uh, highway safety. Um, I believe it was dismissed appeal on the grounds of character and appearance and residential amenity, but was uh, found to be acceptable in terms of highway safety. Um, so just going back to aerial photography. Um, so again, it's, the site is in here. Um, the history of the site, it was um, previously from about 20, uh, the 70s till the late 90s used at, for 12, up to 12 private allotments, but that use ceased um, at the end of the 90s and, and the early 2000s. Um, and the site has since been sort of derelict and has largely overgrown with a number of self-seeded trees and um, vegetation. And there's also in some of the photographs we'll see some evidence of some uh, rubbish being tipped on the site as well. Um, but also worth noting, just to the east, uh, we have King George's allotment site here, um, which is accessed via this lane here, which we'll talk about again in a minute, from Lansdowne View. And there's a, there's a pedestrian gate around, it's around here somewhere. Um, also worth noting, just to the north of the site, and we'll see this in the photographs as well, this is um, the old bakery site on Dews Lane, um, which has got permission and is, I think the construction is, is well, it's well underway, I'd say it's nearly complete for uh, 60 beds of student accommodation and, and uh, an employment, a purpose-built employment unit. Um, just some existing sections. So um, if we take the top section first, that's through here. And you can see this is Lansdowne View down here. And you can see that the, the lane slopes up and continues to rise up towards the, um, to the east, leads to the west on Lansdowne View. And you can see the site slopes down towards the railway and then up on the embankment here with the site boundary just being in this location here. Uh, some photographs now. So this is the, um, the, the, the terrace to the west of Lansdowne View. So you can see the, um, the, the railway bridge tunnel under to uh, Jews Lane uh, there. Um, just a, a second view of that. And you can see 
in the background there is, uh, with some of the scaffolding still up, I think, uh, the um, old bakery site with the, the new student development. Looking back up the hill, up Lansdowne View this way. And then a bit further, down, uh, further up, looking back down again. Uh, this is looking uh, along the southern road, houses to the south of the application site. So this is still Lansdowne View, but then leads into King's George, King George's Road. Uh, so you can see the properties there. And then this is the access lane uh, that I was referring to that leads to the, um, to the allotments, the King George's allotments, the pedestrian gate there. There are also a number of garages to the rear of these properties on, on, to the south, um, which are served off, off this lane. I believe the lane is also used um, by Baines in servicing the allotments as well. Um, and then if we move further north, so this is just, uh, just to the left here is the tunnel, the, the rail tunnel I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, and, and at the north end of the terrace, there are some steps in here, some pedestrian steps. They're obviously uh, in a very poor state and, and overgrown. And these uh, form part of the application site and um, would be repaired and this pedestrian route through here to the application site would be, uh, would be um, improved as, as part of the proposals. Just showing another view down there, obviously clearly massively overgrown and not used. Uh, and then further, this is at the north end of the site near the railway embankment looking back to the west, so that's the end terrace on Lansdowne View. And then uh, same position but looking more to the northeast. Um, over the railway line as it goes to the east, and then looking more north would, uh, towards the, the old bakery site building there, and you can see that new development uh, taking place. Uh, then this is similar sort of location, looking up, uh, uh, looking up the site to the south, to the rear, these are the properties on, to the west on, on Lansdowne View, and you can see the site is, is heavily overgrown, uh, and it's not actually possible to get access right into the centre of the site. Uh, and as I said, there's some evidence of, of some rubbish being tipped in, in, in these spaces uh, that are sort of uh, over, overgrown at the moment. Uh, this is on the access lane, looking back northwards over the site. So again, to orientate yourself, this is the terrace on the western side on, on Lansdowne View. And you can see the site is heavily overgrown and there are a number of self-sown trees there. And then looking west, uh, again from the same spot, to walk down the access lane, you can see some of the garages that are um, accessed off the back of this access lane. Uh, this is just a view uh, from further out, so you can orientate yourself with the old bakery building there, and it's sort of in this gap in here is where the site is. Another one from the access lane, this time looking east, uh, with the, you can see the garages on the right, and, and right at the end is the gate, and then looking back, um, a number of, uh, again, uh, trees along here and head, well, a couple of trees and some hedging uh, vegetation along here, which would be removed to uh, widen the access proposals, as we'll see in a moment. And then this is the, uh, the gate uh, at the end of that lane to the uh, King George's uh, allotments. And then from within King George's allotments, um, there's a small piece of land, uh, which was the land that was previously proposed to be built on as part of the Curo appeal from 2013. Um, where there are some raised beds uh, rather than formal allotments um, due to the contamination of the land. Um, and this is looking towards the site, so there's some quite significant hedging and, and vegetation on the, on the boundary. Uh, just another view from the same angle. Uh, and then another, another view of the site, just again emphasizing the overgrown nature of it. Uh, and then one further one looking north um, over the gardens of uh, the, the rear rear the properties on the Lansdowne view. So moving on to the actual proposed plans. Um, so it is proposed to um, erect seven dwellings in a terrace form, which is consistent with the, 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 the form of development in the surrounding area, um, which would be split level. So they would have a, um, a three stories at the front and two stories at the back built into the slope. Um, there is a build out proposed to uh, the, the access here to ensure that there's suitable visibility going up and down Lansdowne view um, and widening of that access lane so that the uh, basically comes up to the edge of the end property here 
Um, this section here, shown sort of hashed, is um, a shared surface, which would be shared between pedestrians and um, vehicles, um, which is a bit of a compromise, but it is necessary due to the constraints of the site and the fact this is, this is quite a pinch point here. So without, uh, if you were to introduce a, a pavement, there simply wouldn't be sufficient room for, um, for, for vehicles. Um, there is a separate, as I said before, a pedestrian access with the steps being reformed and improved up here into the site. Um, it has been revised from its original uh, submission, which was from nine dwellings, and the extent of a replacement landscaping area has been increased. Um, parking is provided to the north end against uh, the, the northern boundary and also within uh, garage, garages on the ground floor, which you'll see in a moment. So existing section through the site and proposed section, so we can see the dwellings here, how they're split level and how they fit in, uh, build in built into the slope, or at least partly built into the slope. And you can see the heights comparable to the heights of um, those uh, terraces on uh, Lansdowne View. Um, just a, another section again there, a bit more detailed, showing you garages on the ground floor, kitchen, dining rooms, etc., bedrooms. Uh, moving on to elevations, so this top one is that uh, northern elevation uh, facing the embankment and towards the, uh, the student block uh, beyond on, on the Jews Lane proposal. Um, you can see three-storey terrace townhouse style uh, dwellings in a, in a contemporary style. Proposed materials are um, rubble uh, natural bath stone at the ground floor level with uh, natural uh, bath stone ashlar at the upper floor levels and um, a double Roman clay tiles for the roof. And then on the rear, it's obviously two storey um, with the gardens at the back. And then just side elevations. So this is the elevation facing towards the rear of um, those properties on the west, the Lansdowne view. So there's two very small windows that are quite some distance from the, from the rear of those properties and they're serving, uh, I believe it's a landing in a hallway or a stairwell. Uh, moving on to floor plans. Again, I, I won't dwell on these, but there's EV chargers in each of the garages um, proposed and then you've got ground floor living accommodation and then upper floors, bedrooms, and then you've got a double valley uh, pitched roof with uh, solar panels on the internal uh, sort of valley uh, for each of the each of the proposed dwellings. Um, there's a CGI um, that's been submitted by the applicant. Um, obviously, being a CGI, it's not a, a visually verified uh, sort of. I can't uh, confirm it 100% accuracy, but it gives you an idea of the the style of the the proposed dwellings on the site and and the areas that would be utilised for landscaping. Um, Finally, it's worth saying that there would be a Section 106 agreement as part of this um, permission if, if it were to be granted, which would require uh, contributions towards tree replacements because, as I said, there are a number of um, self sown trees on the site which would have to be removed to, to enable this development. Um, the amount of tree replacements wouldn't feasibly be able to fit back onto the site because the self sown trees are so close together they're not likely to flourish, but based on our... Uh, our, our calculation and formula for replacement trees, they would have to provide um, a number of those on-site and a number of those as off-site contributions, which would be acceptable to the arboriculturalist. Uh, there would be need for a private management company to control, the, to control and manage the communal areas of development, landscape ecological management plan, and the implementation of those highways works that I mentioned as well. Um, that's uh, everything for the presentation. Happy to take any questions after the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have five speakers on this. And first of all, we have Michael Hill and Jenny Backhoff, who I understand are sharing their three minutes. Are you, um, you've sorted out between yourselves who's going first and how you're sharing it. Okay, if you turn the mic on when you're ready, we'll start the timer, thank you. Hi. On behalf of all surrounding residents and allotment holders, this is the third attempt at developing this site, which is exactly the same and still not suitable at all. There is already subsidence on the existing properties. This will affect the proposed houses. There is a natural spring and it will cause the new development problems. This is a natural habitat where foxes and badgers are nesting now, an array of birds nesting in aged trees. There are no amenities at all. 
The proposed vehicle entrance and exit is far too narrow for ambulances and fire engines, and the rail bridge nearby is also too low for them. Number 11 Lansdowne View will today place another bollard at the end of her boundary, making the lane even narrower. Lansdowne View houses have 24-7 access to the front of their houses, and also people going to the allotments, as that is the only wider gate. Exiting on to Lansdowne View will be very dangerous, as it's a busy two-way road and just next to King George's Road exit. The pedestrian access is totally unsuitable for anyone with disabilities. Climate change is everyone's concern. This development would not improve it by squashing expensive eco-homes into this wild sanctuary. Has any of this planning committee actually visited the site and driven in and out of the above advised lane? I implore you to refuse this application or defer this for a site visit before making any judgments. Thanks. Okay, very quickly, just a very quick one on, uh, on drainage at the rear of the property. There is no drainage, uh, absolutely none at all. Uh, I had a, a survey done by Wessex uh, two years ago because I was having a problem with my drains and we found out that everything was basically a uh, joint soak away with no drainage whatsoever. So bear in mind, as you've seen from those diagrams, all our houses and our properties slope down towards that land. You will obviously not be stupid to realise that that could present some real issues for us. <clears throat> and we will have subsidence issues. I cannot see how we won't. Uh, the other thing is, nothing's changed. This is the third time this has been tried to build on here, and as far as I'm concerned, access and egress, nothing's changed in 15 years. The traffic is a lot heavier than it was 15 years ago, and we simply think that this is completely unnecessary, and it's just not in keeping with, with the general area. And just to reiterate, I don't know how, how you can make a decision on this if you haven't actually visited the site or even come to look at it. I requested a, a, a visit by the, by the officer for this who evidently couldn't be bothered despite the fact I asked him specifically to come and meet me and have a look at it, which I thought was disappointing. Uh, local councillors have visited it, I know. So really and truly we, we ask as a minimum just to reiterate, at least come and have a look at it first, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next could we have Chris Bieber to speak. Uh, yeah, if you switch it on. Yep, all good. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm representing the applicant. Um, uh, by way of background, the vacant application site has not been used for any uh, beneficial purpose since it was an allotment over 20 years ago. Um, it does, however, lie within the defined Bath urban area where the principle of residential development accords with your own development plan policy. So it can be legitimately considered as an in, uh, a windfall site. The application proposal um, was subject to pre-application consultation with neighbours and surveys were under, undertaken across a range of um, technical disciplines. The, ap the, applicant, the application has been subject to a pro process of um, post-submission negotiation with, with the planning officers. They put a lot of time into this, and um, the revised scheme before you, which is a, a seven-unit terrace, um, has allowed for the provision of additional green infrastructure to compensate for the removal of the self-seeded trees. This will create a diverse and managed habitat, which will deliver a biodiversity net gain, as well as a high-quality um, setting for the development and adjacent properties. The proposed houses have been designed as family homes with private gardens and garages, and the communal areas, as indeed the access, will be managed by a private management company. Each property is designed as an accessible home and exceeds the minimal sustainable construction requirements as required by the council sustainable construction checklist. The design of the vehicular access, and this is an important point, um, has been subject to an independent road safety audit. So that was a, a, a separate road safety auditor went out to assess the junction. The new junction includes road widening into third party land of the adjacent house and a build out into the highway. This will slow passing traffic speeds and will be beneficial to all users of the road. 
As well as providing a safe access to the proposed development, the new access will provide a clear betterment for existing users of the access in terms of the rear garages and for council operatives managing the adjacent allotments. Um, despite the comments from a small number of third parties, we can definitively confirm that the applicants have full control of the application site and they have served the correct notices. In summary, this proposal will deliver much needed new family housing in Bath, where there is, we're all aware that there's an acute housing need in Bath. Um, there are no outstanding technical ob objections. All, all the consultees um, are supportive of the scheme. And on this basis, um, we request that you uh, grant planning permission subject to the Section 106 obligations outlined on the screen. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, both ward councillors, Councillor Dina Romero and Councillor Paul Cross. If you could come up to the front, please. I don't know who's going first, um, but whoever is, when you're well, ready. I've got the mic, so I'm going first now. So, uh, good afternoon, Chair and, and Committee. Um, a couple of you will remember uh, the scheme in 2013 to, to develop this land into an estate of 11 houses and 10 flats. Access was from King George's Road. That scheme was turned down due to the harm it would cause residents from the overdevelopment, and that decision was supported by the planning inspector. The main concerns I have with this new scheme are the inadequacy of the access to the site. Vehicle and pedestrian access are proposed to be taken via a modified lane joining Lansdowne View to the southwest of the site. This entrance is just about a small car's width wide, and while possible, possibly suitable access for parking for number 10 Lansdowne View and the garages for Lansdowne View before joining uh, King George Road, it seems to my untrained eye too narrow for the additional cars expected. It has already been deemed too narrow for the council's refuse vehicles and possibly for fire tenders. Despite numerous amendments, the proposed access fails to provide adequate pedestrian, cycle and vehicle access and will put vulnerable users of the access road at risk of harm. The developers acknowledge this by stating that the road would not be offered for adoption and that residents would be expected to pay separately for their waste and recycling to be collected through a private firm whose chief criteria to be used would be the size of its vehicles. A secondary pedestrian route is proposed via an existing path and steps to Lansdowne View, uh, sorry, from Lansdowne View to the northwest of the site, which would be upgraded as a result of the development. Firstly, I think you should know this access is not in the gift of the developer. The steep and narrow stairs appear, according to deeds I have seen, to be in a shared ownership for use by residents of numbers one to eight Lansdowne View. As I have said, these are steep steps and as such unsuitable for those with mobility or visual impairments. These are not new issues. Indeed, the previous scheme in this site or for this site, did not even consider access from either of these points, but instead required the partial demolition of housing to the east of Lansdowne View in King George Road. Well, and that's not all. As well as the spring, which again is not mentioned in the application, there is also further concern about drainage, as you heard from uh, a resident earlier. It appears that for houses on Lansdowne View to the north of the site, much of the drainage from the gutterings comprises of mere soakaways into the land currently earmarked for de development. It is quite possible that adequate new drainage for these houses, and presumably for the new houses, will prove to be prohibitively expensive, and certainly something of a challenge for the developer. Yet I can see nothing that fully addresses this problem in the papers submitted. Surely this should be a key issue to be addressed, particularly as climate change is making rainfall uh, more and also less predictable, unless the plan is simply to get permission and sell on, with such issues unresolved until they have to be, and so the scheme becomes more and more expensive and any question of affordability is finally driven out of this development. I note too the comments by the Allotment Association and would support turning this land back to allotments if this application fails. Um, in the end, and I would welcome officers' further thoughts on that if that could be achieved, bearing in mind the question of contaminated land. But before we get to that point, obviously we need to determine this application. My preference is that you refuse this application, but if you are considering approving this scheme, 
please consider a site visit first so you can see for yourself the difference between what you are being presented with here by the developer and the reality, especially around the challenges of access. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try not to repeat everything that Dina said, but it was a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, report. Uh, the, um, um, Chris said that there weren't many uh, objections. In fact, if you look at it, there's over 44 objections, uh, uh, and there's not a single supporting comment. This is a hugely uh, controversial uh, application, and the reason it's controversial is because it's just not suitable for development. Uh, it is a very narrow access. The stairs that you were shown are actually the private property of numbers one to eight, as is a strip that goes along the back of one to eight uh, also. But um, the, the occupants, for whatever reason, haven't been maintaining it because they've not felt the need to get in through their, their back fence. But I'm sure that that might be something that's corrected now uh, to make sure that they don't get a fourth application in a few years' time. The access that you saw to uh, where the road access is, Brian, you see, you'll, you'll see on the picture, if you, when you have your debate, if you ask for that picture to come back up again, you'll see that there's a bollard placed there. And that, that marks the end of the property of the, the, uh, that house there. So it's not the fence that is the end of the ownership, it's where the bollard is. And if you look at where that bollard is, it then makes it completely unsuitable for any large vehicle to get down through that. So what the developers were hoping were, were just to use people's private property to get their vehicles down and then develop it and knock down the hedges afterwards. So also they said, it, the comment was made that, that there is no value in this land. Uh, well, it's been a wildlife habitat for years, that in itself is of a, a value. Stuff that is left unmanaged is often attracting a range of, uh, uh, of, of animals and habitats and uh, inhabitants that don't go to well-managed, pristine nature reserves. You know, uh, all animals don't like well-managed, pristine. They like a bit of chaos sometimes. And uh, there's been a wide variety of animals uh, seen in this one, in addition to the regular badgers and foxes that, and rabbits that we all talk about. There's been uh, other uh, wildlife seen there as well. So you've got uh, a lot of interest there. Uh, you, you, there's no uh, amenity gain for, for the residents in either side looking over this. And when you look at this as a site, you've then got uh, the huge, uh, you've got the railway, but you've actually got uh, the huge development that's going on next door at the old bakery. Now, this committee was completely right, in, in my view, in approving uh, the old bakery because that was completely developed land and it was an opportunity. This is not the same at all. It is completely undeveloped land, it's completely unused land, which has been allowed decades to just uh, develop its own ethos and lifestyle. So, as Dina said, it's unsuitable for emergency access, so you'd be building houses into which uh, it would be greatly difficult for emergency vehicles to get down uh, unless they knock down uh, the barricade, or sorry, the, the barrier that's been put up uh, and knock down people's private property to, to enable themselves to get through. There's also the impact of the Soka Way, which has been mentioned, and that is quite a big fear for all the residents of, of 1 to 8. So for a number of reasons, uh, my own view is that you should uh, come to a different view uh, from the officers, and, and I would just take issue with the speaker that said uh, our, our officers hadn't been to see this. Uh, our officers have been to see this site, and, and uh, uh, so I'd just like to correct that in your mind. Um, so it might, I think the, one of the issues was that the application changed hands for consideration during the course of it. So there's a number of reasons uh, why you can object this, but if, if you feel that this is a very complicated site uh, and there's been some very controversial, sorry, some very substantially different interpretations of land ownership and land access, uh, and you'd like to look at that, then uh, at the very least, organize a site visit. But my own preferred option is that you reject this for the third time. Uh, and I know each time the numbers are diminishing, uh, and even if they diminish to one, uh, this is not a suitable site for development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Sophia. Uh, so we'll move on to questions to the case officer. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at page 79 um, and what it says about sustainability and climate emergency. And I don't quite understand these two paragraphs. It says the site is located in an existing residential area with good access to services and facilities. I can't, if you can't get a, a I, I don't quite understand that one. Does it mean that residents can go out and obtain what they want? Or is it a reference to the fact that, uh, well, I think rubbish collection is, is going to be an issue um, about services coming into the site and um, I, did, I wondered if the officer could show us if there's any sort of turning circle um, for any delivery vehicle because we're all very well aware that since COVID you get all these deliveries from the various companies bombing in and out of very small roads and I'm wondering what the consequences would be here if you got a big supermarket van turning up or, or do they have to you know, is rubbish going to have to be left in the passageway? Would the residents have to come to the entrance to pick up their parcels? I'm, I'm not clear. That's the first thing. And um, the second paragraph there, the proposals will provide a 70.4% reduction in carbon emissions, exceeding the target. I don't understand how that's calculated and how having vehicles bombing in and out of here is going to reduce carbon emissions, if, if that's what it refers to. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, on the first point on what that paragraph is in reference to, uh, it probably should read good accessibility uh, to services. It's not a comment on the access proposals, the high, specific highways access proposals, which we can talk about in a moment. Uh, but it's talking about the, sustainability, the sustainable location of the site, i.e., it is close to services and has good access to services and facilities for residents. It's in a built. It's in the. It's in Bath, um, where uh, you know there is a good range of services and uh, and, and um, shops for people to access. And so that's what makes it at that simple level uh, a sustainable site for building new homes because it's close to services rather than building it out in the countryside where there might be less access to those things. Um, on the point about the turning circle, uh, there's a turning head uh, located within the site up here. And that's all been checked out by highways and that's all fine. Um, on the point of rubbish collection, uh, as, I, as has been alluded to and I've mentioned, there would be a, 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 the road is not to be adopted, so this wouldn't be um, Bain's uh, waste services collecting the rubbish. There would be a private waste collection uh, service uh, that would, you know, would have smaller vehicles that would be able to get into the site uh, and service the site from from the front as as per anyone uh, you know as, as a normal sort of waste collection would uh, and they're able to turn and, and go back out again on the carbon emissions point um, the 70 percent reduction is um, a reduction over the the baseline is based on um, building regulations the part l uh, energy requirements for buildings so that's um, the efficient energy efficiency of the building it doesn't uh, refer to operational sort of um, uh, emissions related to uh, travel to and from the site or anything like that. So it's based on our policy CP2, um, which currently requires a 19% reduction in carbon emissions from buildings um, uh, over, the, over the existing baseline. Uh, I think that covers all your points, Councillor Jackson. Okay, Councillor Jackson, have you got a follow-on? Uh, no, I'm, you know, I'm thankful to be enlightened. Uh, but I, I do sort of wonder whether in the overall scheme of things, we, would it be a pro not be appropriate to think about the impact of a built development on a space that is currently a green space um, and whether the dire shortage of allotments has been taken, in, which is diff I mean, one of the things is how different this is from 2013 when I went on a site visit. Um, whether that has been taken in, and the allotments and community growing spaces uh, is now signalled as a, a need, whereas in 2013, and I remember we were saying, we were told there were vacant allotments at the nearest allotment ground, but I believe that's not the case now. I wondered if the officer would want to comment on growing space availability. 
in terms of the first part of your question about impact on, on green space, I just make the comment that you know it, it is within within the built up area of Bath. It is uh, obviously uh, heavily vegetated now. Uh, and green in that sense, but it would represent a windfall site where the principal development in accordance with our development plan is acceptable. Um, there are uh, other considerations around the impact on ecology and, and uh, landscape and all those other things which are discussed in the report. Um, and then on the point around uh, shortage of allotments, um, as I set out in the report, there's um, the, the, the allotment, the private allotment use that was historically on this site has long since ceased. And this is not within um, an area that's of protected allotments uh, within our local plan. So King George's allotments to the east, for example, is. Um, this site is not. Um, and there's no uh, requirement on windfall sites like this within the center of Bath um, where they're, where they're uh, minor developments like this, so less than 10 houses, to have any um, additional allotment provision. Now, that being said, uh, to be clear, there is a shortage of allotments in this area. I believe the King George allotments the information on our, the council's website says there's a five-year waiting list currently for those, but that would not be it, it, to, to, in officer's view that would not be a reason to reject this application. Okay, Mr. Jackson, does so that answer your question? To make sense, I'm um, trying to work out from the diagram there. Does each house have a growing space? Uh, if you can, so this here is representative of a garden for each property so uh, you know they could grow uh, things within those gardens if they chose to but uh, it's not formal allotments okay council Bromley. thank you chair um yes i'm just wondering um if the site has been assessed for those with mobility impairments because um um, obviously, the, the, the lane, the, the narrow access lane, is shared with vehicles. That seems, you know, rather sort of unsafe, really. And um, you mentioned that the pedestrian route, um, the steps are going to be um, uh, refurbished and, and, and repaired. But again, you know, that's that's no use for people with mobility impairments. And I just wondered at a time when I can think of two other locations in in Bath where the sort of for example, um, steps are being removed from a, a, a little bridge, pedestrian bridge, and a ramp's been put in. I just wondered about the accessibility here, really, and if an assessment has been made. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bromley. Yeah, we, we've looked closely at this, and, and uh, we, we, we've worked hard to try and figure out a way that, you know, that, that the accessibility of the site, particularly for those with um, mobility issues or, or visual impairments, can be maximised or optimised. Um, the site constraints do make that difficult. Um, as you say, the, the steps to the north, um, uh, my understanding is they've looked at um, whether you can get a ramp in there, but because of the various levels, uh, d the steps are quite high up, um, the tightness of that space and the uh, issues with you know, ha having to do those works adjacent to the boundary of, of the, the, the end terrace there, that's just not really feasible. Um, and then in terms of the, the, uh, the, the access point down here, um, and the shared surface, um, that is uh, less, less than ideal, and in an ideal world you would have a segregated uh, pedestrian path. Um, but obviously there is only so much space available. Uh, and we did look at various iterations of having a sort of a refuse island uh, that pedestrians should sort of hop onto, but then that would actually cause more of an issue for those with buggies or in wheelchairs as they wouldn't be able to hop on and off um, out of the roadway. Um, but this approach of, of, of visually demarking the, um, the shared surface area, along with the, the pinch point that is created, will slow um, traffic uh, speeds down. In, in any case, traffic speeds at this location will be slow, coming off a, a, a junction and, and approaching a junction. Um, and it's felt that the uh, accessibility, uh, that, that, sorry, from a highway safety point of view, that is um, acceptable. Um, and it's the best option in terms of accessibility. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say it's perfect, because it absolutely is not. Um, but it, um, taking into account the site's con constraints, it's probably the best that we can achieve on this site. And the applicant has worked quite closely with us to, to achieve that. Okay, Councillor Bromley. 
Thank you. I mean, it just, it just seems, um, you know, thinking about people with um, push chairs, etc., they're going to have to use the, this sort of shared access lane. And if you've got a delivery van sort of chasing in with time constraints, it, it just seems rather sort of risky, really. But, um, you know, I, I, that's, that's a, just that's a consideration, really, I'd have thought. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, our highways officer has kindly provided the calculations for the estimate on the amount of vehicle movements this site will generate. And the calculation, I believe, was 82 vehicle movements per, per 12 hour period, for each day for a 12 hour period. Um, so, my question or my concern is looking at this access point, it's a single lane access. So only one vehicle can fit along that access at any one time. Assuming 82 vehicle movements a day, you can pretty much guarantee that vehicles are going to meet at some points quite often during the day. So if you've got two vehicles that meet at this access point, how far does the car have to reverse to let in the vehicle coming in off the main road? What's the nearest, how far will they have to go back? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hughes. I'll, I'll, ask the, yeah. I'll ask the highways officer to answer that one. Thank you, committee. So the access um, does narrow. As you can see, there's a pinch point there, which is 3.4 metres wide, and that pinch point is 17 metres from the back edge of the carriageway. As you can see, the road is quite straight, so there's quite good intervisibility. Once you get past that pinch point, you can see the block paving then um, get widened out. Chris, would you mind using the cursor? So you see it widens out there, and it widens out to 4.8 metres, which is suitable for two vehicles to be able to pass each other. So really, it, it is a narrow access, but because of the intervisibility, you should be able to see an oncoming vehicle stop at the wider point, let that vehicle pass, um, especially given the low number of trips per day but I couldn't say categorically that two cars will not meet at some point during that narrow bit and one one vehicle would have to reverse okay and we think that 82 vehicle movements is is low I mean it's going to increase we're, we're saying 280 vehicle movements per day on Lansdowne view so it's going to increase that by over a third um, so the other question then I have is that there's 15 parking bays, but those are including garage, garages. So assuming that none of, those, none of those garages have a driveway in front of them, so do we really think that people are going to go out these 12 journeys per day that they're expected to make per, per house? So they're going to drive out of their property to pick the kids up from school, come back, put the car back in the garage take the car back out of the garage to go and drive and pick the kids up from somewhere else. I, it just doesn't seem realistic that the amount of parking, if, including garages, is, is suitable, particularly with the layout of the site. Thank you, Councillor. So the parking provided is in accordance with our currently adopted parking policy. You will um, you have heard the comments around human behaviour and driver behaviour in particular about garaging, I can confirm that the garages all meet our minimum dimensions, which is three metres by six metres. Um, and of course, as part of the transport and development supplementary planning document, which is in draft <laughs> and has been out to consultation, you, you'll note that we are proposing that garages are no longer counted within the parking provision, but that is as yet not adopted policy. So I would just reiterate that our current adopted policy is that garages do count and the garages conform to our current policy. Okay, but, but are we allowed to take into consideration the, the, the new parking standards that are coming into play? Uh, so just to jump in and answer that, that it, at, at this time they should only be given limited weight because they haven't um, been through the examination. And just to highlight as well, there is condition 25 uh, listed in the recommendation, which requires that the garaging is used for the garaging of private motor vehicles associated with a dwelling. 
uh, and, and, and to do domestic storage and for no other purpose. So um, to a degree, the management of that parking area, it, 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 it will be down to the residents as, as any parking associated with, um, with any residential development is. They can choose to use it or they can choose not to use it and park on the street. There's no way we can stop that or restrict that, but the parking spaces have been provided in line with the policy. Okay. Well, it is, our, it is our problem if it overspills out onto Lansdowne View that causes parking issues outside of the state. So, so can I just ask one more question? So, a completely different subject. So this pedestrian access, which apparently is not in the ownership of the current developers. So what, what happens if the current owners refuse to allow that to be upgraded? What, does that, what effect does that have on the uh, application? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hughes. Um, so we've got uh, not been presented with any evidence. We've not been presented with any evidence to suggest that it's not within the owner, ownership of the applicant, and they have served um, Certificate A, which suggests that they do own all of the land, and that was confirmed by the speaker uh, it, it, who representing the applicant today. Uh, ownership is not generally a material uh, mat uh, consideration in terms of determining a planning application. But what we are proposing is that um, a uh, grampian can, if, if, that, if it turns out that that is wrong and that ownership question is, is up for debate, then um, the condition requiring uh, that uh, access to be up, the pedestrian steps to be upgraded and improved would essentially become a gramping condition. That means they basically um, wouldn't be able to uh, carry out the development without, um, without first getting agreement to do all those works from the other landowners. Um, and just to that end, um, because there does seem to have been some debate on it, um, I'm going to propose, uh, I'm going to just update the um, officer's recommendation slightly in, in, in respect of condition 26, um, which is regarding that footpath. Um, condition 26 says no occupation of development shall commence until details of a scheme to clear and resurface the secondary pe pedestrian access to the north of the site, shown on the drawings. Um, pedestrian access shall be cleared and resurfaced in accordance with the approved details prior to occupation of any dwelling. I'm um, going to change that from a pre-occupation condition to a pre-commencement condition. Um, that essentially means that it becomes a Grampian condition then, and so they wouldn't be able to carry out those works without the... Um, uh, without the uh, authority of whoever the landowner might be. But as I said, the evidence we've got suggests that the applicant is the landowner. We've got no evidence to the contrary. Does that answer all your questions? Good. Councillor McPhee and then Councillor Hansel. Am I on? Yep. Uh, just picking up some of the uh, comments uh, from the floor, if we start with the bollard, w where is the bollard? Could you show us on the cursor? Or actually... Well, if you go back to the plan... So that bollard there, if that's the end of their land, as we understand it, you're saying you have 3.4 metres between that bollard and the other side of the road. Is that correct? At the point where the access is, where the bollard is, um, you'll see the vegetation on the left-hand side of the picture up against the terrace. That's all being cleared out, so the access will be widened. At its narrowest, which is seven metres into the development, it is 3.4 metres. It's wider at the back edge of the footway. Um, but it's not consistently wide enough for two vehicles to pass until it widens out as you get further down the lane. Yeah. But right. I, would, I would confirm that... 2.75 metres width is the width required to get a fire tender down that lane. So, so the minimum is 3.4 based on the plans that we've right. measured, and the fire tender requires a minimum of 2.75 to just drive. Uh, and, and that vegetation 
is that in the public or does that belong to a third party? My understanding that's within the control of the applicant. Um, right. So we have something that is a minimum of 3.4 and is actually wider with the bollard there. It's wider at that point. Yeah. It then narrows and then widens back out again, okay. councillor. I've got one more, if that's all right. Another one that was mentioned was to, to do with the bollard. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> right, if I could just come in, because my question was about the bollard. So to be clear, is the bollard remaining? Is it staying? Uh, so I, un I understand that there is uh, some sort of land ownership dispute about the bollard, um, but uh, you know it, it, it's not shown on on the drawings. Um, and uh, again, this uh, the point I made about the um, uh, the point I made about the secondary pedestrian access and it being a grampian condition. The sim similar would apply in respect of the highways works to form the access. So those land ownership issues would have to be um, resolved be between the applicant and, and those landowners before they would be able to implement any permission. But it's, as I said, landowners not a matter, uh, not a material consideration for members to try and opine on or, or dispute today. Can I just have a follow-up? Yeah. Right, can I just have a follow-up to that? Because it might be considered with the bollard there that there isn't sufficient access. If the bollard wasn't there, you just might decide that there was. So actually, it's incredibly important to know whether that bollard is going to remain or be taken away. And I can't see how we could give planning permission on something that is in the future that we have no knowledge of. Thank you, Councillor Crossley. So Chris is going to pull up the drawing which shows the proposed access arrangements. And you will see on that drawing the bollard, that silver bollard that you've just seen in that photograph, does not exist. You will also notice that the red line of the application in sight includes that land. So the access, as shown on that proposed drawing, is the access that highways are recommending acceptance of. If that access cannot be delivered in accordance with those plans, then the development cannot come forward. And, and so they, that's why we say those, those third-party land disputes need to be resolved, because they need to bring the development forward in accordance with that plan there. OK, Councillor. So, so returning to Councillor Lefee, you have some more questions? <laughs> yes, you are on. Yeah. Uh, another thing that was uh, commented on was that there's a natural spring in, in that area. Uh, but also, the, uh, several people have mentioned that the, there is a, a large drainage soak away uh, area there and that there is no drainage so that you're starting again there. Is, is this something that's been factored into your calculations? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor McPhee. Um, so uh, in terms of a natural spring, uh, again, I've, I've heard this mentioned, but again, I've not been presented with any evidence of, of where this is or, 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 or you know, what effect it might have. Um, our drainage team, a drainage and flood risk team, have looked at the application proposals. Uh, they have raised no objection subject to conditions requiring detailed of the drainage proposals. Um, it is proposed to have a, a private attenuation system as part of the... Um, proposals for the surface water uh, and they have submitted evidence of the suitability of the land for infiltration, um, so water soaking into the ground essentially. Um, and they've also, we've also consulted with Wessex Water who have no objection to the proposals. So there is a condition requiring the full details, um, but uh, the, the details that, we've submitted, that have been submitted thus, thus far um, uh, demonstrate that an acceptable scheme can come forward. Okay. Um, one quick final question. Why did you decide not to adopt the road? It cannot be built in accordance with adopted, adoptable standards, given the site constraints. That shouldn't be confused with not being safe or suitable, but it's not up to adoptable standards. OK. Uh, Councillor Hodgson, did you get all your questions answered? Was that the only one you did? Uh, Councillor Hodgson. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a, a, just a follow-up question. So I had a similar one about the drainage. You, you said the flooding and drainage team have raised no objection. And 
in, I haven't been back through their reports, but have they, they have specifically considered the issue of soakaways? They've, they've looked into that and were aware of that, um, was my first question. And the second one is about the tree planting. So um, I just wanted to be clear about, um, there seemed to be the arboriculturist initially objected to the plans and then her, her second report um, was, was um, with conditions. And she talked about a conflict between achieving the biodiversity net gain in that area. I, I just wonder what the f figure was and what they're ho how they're hoping to achieve a net gain um, compared to what's there now. And a conflict between achieving any kind of meaningful tree planting. And uh, just um, looking at the image in front of us does look quite green, but we're losing around 99 trees and has to be offset with about 108, retaining two trees. I'm slightly concerned that the, the, the landscaping plan is seems to be conditional on the remediation work. So I presume that's to do with the contaminated land, what they find. So I'm concerned that the residents nearby could end up with really no tree planting at all. It could be a very bare site with just the two retained because it and it all being offset tree planting. So I mean that I'd just be grateful for some reassurances on how green the site will end up being for um, the residents if, if it does proceed and how the biodiversity net gain is going to be achieved and the additional question about soakaways. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hodge. Um, so just to be, just to clarify on the trees, um, the arboriculture report identifies there's 19 individual trees, uh, one hedge, which is sort of formed of six, six trees essentially, and seven groups of trees uh, containing 74 trees, uh, which uh, a significant number of which are, are very small saplings. So whilst that 99 figure does sound quite l large, it's it's there are quite a lot of small trees self-sown, as, as we've discussed already. Um, in terms of uh, achieving uh, biodiversity net gain, um, so this is part of the reason the scheme has been reduced from nine to seven dwellings to allow for more landscaping space. Now, the landscaping details shown on here currently are indicative. Um, so it may not be um, that you have all these little trees uh, planted together like that. Um, and there is an issue uh, in respect of the contamination, which you've highlighted, uh, because the remediation strategy is not yet fully formed or known, and that may have implications for the amount or the layout of the trees and things like that do. But that's why we've I've attempted to structure the obligations and the conditions to ensure that those two things take account of each other, and we are not just left with a remediation strategy which precludes tree planting uh, in, in its entirety or anything like that. And also there is the provision within the obligations to uh, for any uh, replacement trees that can't be accommodated on site, and there will be some, as I said, um, the current trees are too close together because of their self sown nature to really flourish. Um, and so uh, the, the obligation requires uh, that any um, trees that can't be replaced on site, any required replacements that can't be replaced on site, that we would take a contribution towards off site uh, planting, which we can use in various projects around the city. And that taken together, so the on site and the off site planting, will achieve a, 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 a net gain. It's, it's a fairly nominal net gain in this instance, but it, it is, uh, that's how it would be achieved. Oh, and on the drainage point, um, they did look at the um, infiltration uh, point. The drainage. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mansell. Uh, right. Uh, um, I've realised that this doesn't satisfy the criteria for uh, infill development. So, to my mind, this looks like backland development. And if it's backland development, I thought we had policies against backland development. Um, I would. Uh, I would. I would. Yeah, I would agree with your uh, definition of it as backland development um, rather than infill development. We don't have policies that explicitly restrict backland development. Um, it, policy, oh, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. It's one of the D policies, D7 maybe, um, talks about uh, in, infill backland development will be acceptable where it is consistent with the character of the area, doesn't impact on residential amenity, and those sorts of tests that we apply to new development. So there's no explicit... Uh, restriction on black land development within um, within our policy, and as I said, it's within the urban area of Bath where the principle of new develop new residential development is acceptable in principle. 
Okay. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Chair. I'm still bothered about the access and this question with the bollard and what the councillors have drawn our attention to. Now, I, I understand why it's not going to be adopted, and it does seem to me there's a very... On my metric, you know, I'm one of these old people who still thinks in uh, imperial, but I still think there's a very narrow margin between what this is going to actually be and what the minimum acceptable is. It's, uh, I think, about five inches. I mean, it's not much. So, you know, there's plenty of scope there. So it seems to me the obvious logical thing to do to get around this problem of the dangerous entrance is to have some signage. Uh, but would I be right in thinking that if it's not an adopted passage, you, we can't actually put up any sort of, get the developer to put up any uh, signage? Because if you've got one of these supermarket deliveries at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, as we get in my small road, uh, which is not a great deal wider than this one, um, there's a, you know, it's a recipe for an accident. Is it possible to have any sort of signage? Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Yes, if, if the councillors would wish, if this committee um, makes a recommendation, we can add a suitably worded condition that requires the development to submit a signage strategy which points out the narrowings and um, waiting places. And to urge caution, we can absolutely add that condition on for you. OK, uh, any other questions? Um, I had three, two of which have been answered, but just one last one, please, Chris. That area down, if you come in the pedestrian route, um, to, right to the to the left on the picture of the new buildings, what what is going on there? Is that steps or or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's. I believe that's a, a series of, because the, the, um, the site slopes, those are just a representative of a series of slopes um, for the path. So these aren't um, steps. These tighter lines together are steps. So there are some steps there uh, and some steps there. So these are, these are slopes. So going back to the ac accessibility question was asked earlier on then, really, if you're in a mobility scooter or wheelchair or whatever, you would have to use the access road all the way around to um, gain access to the properties? That, that would be correct, yeah. Lovely, OK. Uh, any more questions? If not, we'll move to the debate. And who would like to open the debate? No, after all those questions. Councillor Hodge. Yeah, so I'd like to leave a site visit, please. Okay, do we have a second for a site visit? Councillor Jackson. Okay, so would anybody like to uh, debate, discuss any matters to do with the site visit specifically? I so can't debate anything else now that that has been put forward. Councillor Jackson. It's a comment. I mean, I went on the 2013 site visit. This is a really extraordinary site, so I would think it would be really advisable for councillors to go and see for themselves if they haven't actually been up that passageway. Councillor Hansel, did you have a I was only going site? to say, I think I've heard enough and seen enough to, to form a judgment. Uh, but um, if people want to go on a site visit, I will support that. But just to say that uh, I think I know enough to make a decision. OK, thank you. Any more comments about the site visit? If not, we'll take a vote. No? OK, so the proposal uh, we have on the table, the motion we have on the table is to have a site visit Opposed by Councillor Hodge, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? Nine. And against? Oh, that is unanimous actually, because we haven't got Mr. Uh, Councillor Crossley on the committee. So um, that is carried. Thank you. Um, we need to switch over offices again. So a uh, quick comfort break again if anybody needs it. We've been going for another hour. so.
Um, third and last one of the day, which is 36 Nations Avenue, Peace Down St. John. Uh, if I could invite the only case officer, Owen Hall, to present his report when he's ready, please. Uh, hello. Um, so this is an application at 36 Nations Avenue in Peace Down St. John, um, and it relates to the erection of a two-storey side extension and a single-storey rear uh, extension. Um, and it's a resubmission of a previous um, proposal which was refused um, on transport and visual amenity grounds. Um, so this is the site location plan. Um, this is 36 Nations Avenue, um, as you can see. Um, so this is the existing and proposed site plans. This is the existing and this is the proposed um, two-storey extension um, located towards the rear of the dwelling um, behind the existing um, roof apex. Um, these are the existing floor plans, so it's a three-bedroom dwelling um, with a driveway to the side, a garage, and you can see the rear garden. Um, and here you can see the proposed floor plans, so it's, uh, it's got, it attaches to the existing garage, um, but proposes a new garage, um, which measures six by three metres, um, making it a policy compliant parking space. Um, and then there's a parking space to the front of the garage, which measures, uh, I believe, 3.3 by 6 metres, which also makes it a uh, policy-compliant parking space. And um, as a result of the extension, it'll become a four-bed dwelling. Um, so these are the existing elevations, um, the driveway to the side um, and the garages. Um, and this is the existing rear elevation. Um, and these are the proposed elevations, so you can see the uh, two-storey side extension sitting below the ridge line, um, the single-storey rear extension which extends uh, and attaches to the garage, which will give it the internal space for the parking of the vehicle. Um, and these are some photographs of the site. Um, so this is the front of the dwelling, uh, and that's the existing garage. Um, just some more to try and give you some context of the relationship with the dweller next door. Um, it's important to note that this one faces the side of this dwelling. Um, there's some more pictures of the side. There's a picture of the rear of the dwelling. Um, the application is recommended for permission for the reasons discussed within the committee report. Thank you very much. Um, right, I'm not quite sure how many speakers we've got on this time. Have we got someone here from Peace Down St. John Parish Council? We have. Um, would you like to come forward? Yeah, I'm Oh, right, sorry. I'm waving my hand around. So do we have anyone from Peace Down St. John Parish Council? I don't have a name, so possibly not here. Okay. Um, so there were two objectors to speak, Joanne Ellis and... Uh, Louise, so I can't pronounce your so. No. Uh, right, so you are speaking, you're not sharing the time. Would you like to come forward then? If you um, just bring the microphone round to you and turn it on when you're ready. The Planning Committee report comments that the parking provision of two spaces is adequate seems to be a direct contradiction of the previous delegated report of refusal. They comment that paragraph 111 of the NPPF states that development should only be refused on highway ground if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or if the residual cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. In the Baines placemaking plan, it clearly states that the NPPF will allow local authorities to decide whether there is a need for car parking standards. These standards are clearly set out in the Baines Cap policy plan ST7 states that there should be three spaces per four bed dwelling and above. Also paragraph 653 of ST7 states that any departure or reduction in parking spaces from the prescribed standard will need to be fully justified by an accessibility assessment and car parking management strategy. The applicants were afforded the opportunity twice to complete the Baines accessibility form as stated in the placemaking plan in order to reduce parking re requirements. This was not completed. 
Policy ST7 also states that in inter-urban and rural communities, where mobility is more reliant on access to a car, many residential developments have been suffering from strict parking allocations, resulting in parking problems and obstruction of driveways and accesses. It is a matter of public record that the Baines Planning Officer and Head of Baines Planning have both upheld this objection on the previous refusal of this development, and we see no reason why this should be any different on this proposed application. On-street parking is already at a premium in the area. The proposed development is going to increase the footprint of the property from approximately 47 square metres to approximately 87 square metres, almost doubling the size of the property. In the previous delegated report of refusal, it states that due to the large scale of the two-storey element in comparison to the existing dwelling and the proximity of the extension to the site boundary to the west, it would appear cramped within the plot and represent overdevelopment of the site. The proposed development has now been moved even closer to the site boundary to the west to accommodate the increased garage size, coming within 700 millimetres to the west boundary instead of the previous one metre, and be approximately eight metres away from the living room and front bedroom window of number 38. Number 38 will also have potential access issues as they will not be able to open vehicle doors wide enough to allow for disabled access, and access to the property in a wheelchair will be compromised as there will be not enough room to get through. The Parish Council have unanimously objected against this application twice, and Baines has stated that this is a controversial application due to the number of objections. The main issues are the size and visual amenity impact of the size extension. The loss of a parking space and building on a shared driveway remain outstanding. We continue to have no objection to the rear extension, but voting for this would be going against Baines' policy. Also, occupants of number 38 have on several occasions had flooding in the garage and driveway area. There would be loss of the drainage gully that runs across the front of both garages, causing extra runoff and, and possibly exacerbating the uh, overwhelming water that they've had in their garage in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to go back to your seat. And is Lizzie Hillier there, please? When you're ready. Peace Down is our home and has been for 31 years. With my husband being in the armed forces and deploying every year for almost six months, I've managed to build a big support network for myself, our children, and as a family that we would like to maintain by having a property that meets our needs. Peace Down needs more four bedroom properties for growing families, which is why we're choosing to extend, as have numerous properties around Nations Avenue. It would appear that the Parish Council's most recent objection does not seem to have taken the most recent submission into account regarding the parking out of the front of the property, which is no longer in the recent submission. In the recent submission, we feel that we've addressed as many objections as possible while still meeting our requirements. We also feel that two parking spaces will be adequate, as Owen has stated in his report. We would like to accept the condition to keep the garage as, a retain, as it retained for vehicle parking, also stated in Owen's report. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We'd like to go back to the seats and uh, um, open the floor to questions to the officer. Councillor Jackson. Well, in light of what was said about car parking spaces on the previous application and whether you can count the garage or not, I wondered if we could have clarification because Mr. Gomb said that the policy of counting garages had not gone through yet, if I understood correctly. That's the first question. And secondly, I can't quite see how this condition about the garage is remotely enforceable. I think Howard Rose is going to answer that one. Thank you. Thank you. So our current adopted policy is that garages, so long as they're three metres by six metres, which, which we have confirmed, can be counted as a parking space. So this application proposes two parking spaces. Um, our policy requirement is for three, so highways recommended refusal. However, on balance, your planning officer has considered it acceptable. The SPD is uh, in draft form, it has been publicly consulted on, but it isn't adopted, so there's limited weight which you can apply to that, Councillor Jackson. Um, in terms of the condition, it's a standard condition. Um, it is proven to be enforceable. If someone were to convert their garage into, say, a gym, then 
um, it would be enforceable because it wouldn't be for storage or the garaging of a private motor vehicle. Okay, so on to your questions, Councillor Jackson. Well, we're back to this question of ancillary to the house, aren't we? I mean, it, the couple have got a young family, and I can really appreciate their desire, you know, why they want to expand. Um, we can't enforce against them having their garage full of pushchairs. We wouldn't be able to enforce against them store, having the household storage, but um, the, the condition is meant for if there was nobody nowhere else that they would be able to store their vehicle, then obviously the garage would be where they would store it um, in the same vein as there's nothing stopping them from storing things on their existing driveway. Dr. Jackson. Flitted this road a number of times for obvious reasons, and I think I would like to know what what the case is with the other houses around it, uh, whether they use the garages or not, or and whether it's uh, white van country. Um, you know, houses quite frequently have three vehicles because both adults are working and there's a business vehicle. Uh, has any kind of assessment been made of vehicle usage in this road? So, how many ways are you planning, officer? No, we haven't made an assessment of all the houses in this road and their individual parking requirements. The parking policy is based on a set of sort of standardised arrangements, um, and we do that based on census data of car ownership levels per ward, and um, that's how we set it. So, it, it's a broad brush tool. And no, we haven't got any individual assessments of either this house adjoining houses or the wider street. Okay, Councillor Jackson. Well, it is quite walkable from the bus stop, actually, so that's not pretty sure. Yeah, your mic's on now. Sorry. That's okay. Councillor House. Um, the question so far has related to uh, parking standards. I accept that um, that's part of the uh, planning considerations, but am I right in thinking that you uh, cannot turn down a planning application uh, just on that, uh, on those grounds? Um, so we would be able to turn down a planning application just on, pla on transport grounds, but it would need to meet the test in paragraph 111 of the MPPF. Um, which states that development should only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or if the residual cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. Um, and then in, it, in this instance, I didn't think the shortfall of one parking space would uh, meet those tests. Councillor um, Hanson. Right, uh, apologies, my um, iPad is frozen, so the answer might be on my iPad, but I, I, I'll ask you. Uh, there was a comment made about uh, previous planning applications. Um, what, can you tell us what's the difference between what's been refused in the past and this, which you're recommending acceptance? Um, so the planning applications in, well, I believe there was one planning application for a two-story side extension which was submitted. Um, one of them had problems, or it previously had problems because from what I remember, the two-story side extension came to the front elevation of the dwelling, so it wasn't set back from the front of the dwelling. Um, and also it proposed using the access strip as a parking area, which is adopted highway. Um, so this one's been reduced in size to make it subservient to the existing dwelling, and that also allows it to provide a car parking space to the front, whereas before it was using the access strip, which wasn't acceptable in highway terms. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I may have misunderstood, but is, is, is does this house have a shared driveway with the house next to it, or what is the configuration of the um, driveway? So they both have their own separate driveways, and they're side by side, so the dwelling on this side um, has the park into the front of the garage. The dwelling on this side has its park into the front of the garage, so they're separate parking areas. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Hodge, do you have a question? 
Yes, it's in relation to the same thing. I'm trying to, I was, I was looking at um, some of the comments from neighbours and how will the new, the sitting of the new garage affect, there's quite a lot of comments about affecting sight lines and neighbours coming in out and out. So at the moment, the, that's the current garage proposal, isn't it? So that's all very clear to see. Um, how will the sight lines and the building lines affect the, the neighbours on that side? And also the, the, the boundary is now 0.7, less than a metre wide. Does that impact on the neighbour as well? Is it a shared, um, or does it just bring the houses very close together? Um, so it would bring um, this part. So this is the proposed extension. Um, so this would be eight and a half metres away from the front of the um, in front of the dwelling to the, I believe it's the west, um, but it sits below the ridge line of this dwelling um, and it doesn't um, extend past the rear of the dwelling. So it's just bringing the existing built form towards the front of, um, to the front of this dwelling. Um, it's still separated by a front garden and then um, the driveway and this dwelling is set um, slightly above this dwelling, it's kind of on a on a sh slight hill, um, so I don't see there being any um, significant impacts on residential amenity. Okay, any more questions? No, we'll move to the debate then. Who would like to open the debate? Councillor Hansel. Um, this looks uh, very um, the the. the space available here uh, for an extension looks very similar to uh, many extensions that have taken place in the village where I live. Uh, I'm satisfied um, that um, uh, the officers made the case for, um, for this to be uh, permitted and the issue about the parking um, isn't strong enough to object on that point alone. So I, I would move that we accept the officer recommendation to, uh, to permit. Thank you, Councillor Hanswell. Do I have a seconder for that? Is that a seconder, Councillor Jackson? Uh, well, yes. I mean, Councillor Hansel got in faster than me to propose it because, uh, I mean, I think it's unfortunate that nobody from the town council could be here to state their position clearly. Uh, I did tell Councillor Rich it was really important, but... I don't actually think they made out a sufficient case for us to refuse it. It was right you brought it in for discussion. Um, and I think uh, we, we should support it because uh, there's actually a bus stop in front of St. Hughes's Church. Um, not St. Hughes, sorry, St. Joseph's Church, if you look at the map. And if you go along Orchard Road at certain times of the day, like for the collection of school children, there's a bus stop you know, five, ten minutes walk maximum from this house. So I think it's thoroughly accessible. What, you know, we could, we could debate the question of the vehicles parking for some time. Um, I'm afraid even if this had a really wide drive and put two cars on it, there would still probably in a road like this be, uh, re, you know, controversy about it. So I don't think that's an adequate ground for refusing it. I do think Councillor Hansel is right. I have seen quite a number of houses with very similar extensions in this area, and I don't think it's out of, what's the word? For us now is completely acceptable. So um, I don't know how you put negatives into planning grounds, but I don't think the objections can be sustain, sustained. And it is a sustainable location, and it is an appropriate development. That's helpful. Thank you. So um, we have a motion on the table. We can carry on with the debate, though. Councillor Crossley, did you want to speak? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think this is uh, a, a very interesting application. It's in, on one of these estates where uh, once people have they're built to certain sizes and built to certain specifications, and the natural lifestyle of these type of estates is that they change and evolve. And uh, you know, over a period of time virtually every house on the estate gets modified in some way or other, either internally or externally. And I think what we've got here is an application where the, the first submission, the first tranche round, 
was really a little bit over the top, if I can say it. But this one, they've, they've listened to uh, the advice, they've listened to the comments, and they've come back with, with what, in my view, is, is a very acceptable um, uh, modification to their original wishes. Uh, which, which will still provide most of what they want. So I'm more than happy to support uh, the motion as put forward by Duncan and, and Eleanor. Thank you very much. Any more contributions to debate? Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I mean, I mean broadly, I'm, a, I'm a, in a, agreement with um, Councillor Housel on this. Um, I'm just, my only um, concern is, if I understand correctly, we're going to condition the garage must remain as a, as a garage... Um, I'm just not quite clear how that works, how we, can, how we condition that it won't be used as a storage area like most people use their garages, and how we ensure that the garage is used for, for a vehicle and doesn't add to the parking issues in the cul-de-sac. Okay, well, um, the officer can comment on that on highways, but I assume it would be done by somebody reporting them to enforcement if they don't. Absolutely correct, Madam Chair, Lady. So um, it's a very standard condition that we put on to try and make sure the garages aren't converted into um, sort of utility rooms and things like that, and their purpose retains. It, it remains for the garaging of vehicles primarily. Um, we rely on people reporting it to us and us then um, looking back at the planning history and taking, where appropriate, enforcement action. But it does rely on that reporting process. So yeah, I'm still not clear at what point does it become non-compliance. At what point is is a garage not a garage? Um, you know, if you're just if you're storing um, push chairs and bikes and stuff like that in a garage, is is that non-compliance or is it when you actually start converting it into accommodation? Um, it it doesn't. It becomes not a garage anymore. Where you, where you when you cannot store a vehicle in it so it's okay to store push chairs or your camping equipment or your christmas tree or whatever in there but if you store so much in there that it prohibits the parking of a vehicle at that point it tips over okay any more um contributions to the debate before we go to the vote please no so that that condition about garage always being a garage. Uh, can I just check with the officer that that's already on or does it need to be added? Um, that's already on the application. Fine. Okay. So, uh, motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Hanson and seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Item 10, appeals report. Can I ask members if they have any questions or comments on the appeals report? Councillor Davis. Can I just say a huge thank you to the officers for one of the appeals um, that was dismissed because it caused an awful lot of work, I know, because it was in my ward, so, and it's used several officers' time as well, so thank you. Thank you for stating that. I know they work very hard. Councillor Crossley. Uh, yes, can I just add my support for the officers to Sally Davis's? I think, uh, I think if you go back a few years, these committees used to go on day and night because of the agendas were so long. Uh, and I think the development work that we've done between officers and councillors has now reduced that to we have a meeting with three really substantial debates. Uh, well, perhaps the third one wasn't quite so substantial, but the first two were really substantial. And I think our officers are doing a great job. And the fact that there's so few coming now means that uh, we're, I think, delivering a really good planning service. Noted. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure the officers will appreciate it. I know how busy they all are. So, uh, if there's nothing else on the appeals report... Sorry, Councillor Jackson, did you want to speak? Uh, I was just going to say, and I think we welcome the new officers who've joined the team... And hope they'll soon be embedded and get their teeth into some of these hoary enforcement issues we've got. I, I can vouch for that, given the flurry of uh, chair referrals that <laughs> Councillor Davis and I have been receiving from, from new officers. So, yes, they've got their teeth straight into it. Councillor Hansel. Uh, chair, I think it's just worth, worth um, uh, 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 us noting that um, the, the planning application for Waterworks College, um, Cottage, rather, uh, which we had a site visit. It was on very, very steep land, and uh, the application was for, I think, two houses. Originally, it had been three. Um, 
the, the committee uh, refused it, but it's been allowed on appeal. Uh, and I just think that that particular one is, is worth noting and reflecting on. There was a lot of um, local opposition and um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's just emphasised the importance of, of us always maintaining objectivity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well stated. Councillor Crossley, do you want to add to that? I, just a general piece of advice. Uh, I, when I can't go on the recognised site visits, I often go and visit places and just have a look around by myself. But this time we've got a site visit. Well, I, I don't need it for the one in my ward. I've walked around it so many times, I, I know every blade of grass almost. But uh, the home uh, park one, can I just ask for advice? I can't come on the next site visit because I'm on holiday. But I would really like to somehow get into that place and have a look and wander around. Is it appropriate for me to go uh, unaccompanied uh, because I won't be here for the site visit? I think probably, and um, Chris can disagree with me if it's not right, but I think probably if you contact the officer, Isabel, and talk to her, she can maybe talk to the applicant, see if she can uh, facilitate that. So, so the relevant consideration would just be the usual ones on um, bias, perception of bias and predetermination. So uh, if you go on your own, it leaves more it, it leaves more space for people to make claims on that basis, whereas if you go with anybody else, it, it does narrow that down. Um, but clearly with things like predetermination, that's, that's a, a judgment for, for the member themselves before the next committee, and you know, there's not, nothing to suggest there will be any issues there. So I, I, I would say that if possible, it would be best to do it with somebody else, but if not, I don't think it's likely to raise an issue. It, it might be worth speaking to the officer because she's going to possibly have to make some more visits herself, given what we've asked of her today. So you may be able, to, yeah, Isabel, you may be able to accompany her on those visits, perhaps. Um, Councillor Hodge. So I just want to um, follow up on Dr. Councillor Housel's comments. I, I don't agree with those about objectivity on Waterworks Cottage. The, the, you know, it's. The inspector came to a dis different decision, but it wasn't. I think the arguments in turning it down were still, still valid. You know. okay. Thank you for that. Uh, can I just say I was very, very careful with my that? wording, and I, I was not implying that any mistakes have been made. It's worth of reflecting on. Okay, noted. Right, any other? Uh, we'll start on 10 appeals report. Any other um, comments? So if I can just ask uh, everyone to note the report. Uh, next meeting will take place on Wednesday the 29th of June. We do have site visits. They will be on Monday the 20th of June. If you could pencil that in your diary, those of you who can come. Councillor Jackson. I have a clash of dates because um, this consultation or, or whatever it is, briefing on St Williams is on the same day. So. Yeah, Chris, Chris said he will rearrange that. Possible, I was, no, I was going to suggest to somebody who doesn't live in Bath, uh, it might make sense to try and have a combined programme. Um, Do the okay. site visits and then have the briefing or vice versa. I assumed the briefing was going to be uh, online, but yes, that's a possibility. Why don't you speak to no, Chris? No, it says it's in the Guild. It is in person. Yeah, well, perhaps have a word with Chris, see if it can be arranged on the same day. It would be easier for North East Somerset people, I know. Uh, anything else from anybody? If not, I will formally close the meeting. Thank you, everybody.